Thank you very much, members. Good to see you. Thank you very much to the members taking part online. Um, I'm not quite sure where to look to see you, <laughs> but it's good to see you, and um, I'm very glad to see our guests. So whether you're attending virtually or in person, welcome to this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council. My name is Councillor Anna Bradnam, and I'm the chair of South Cambridgeshire District Council. My vice chair is Councillor Peter Fane. Peter Fane, shop. Uh, I just want to make a few housekeeping announcements, please, including important safety information for those present in person. If you're attending the meeting in person, we ask that wherever possible, you wear a face covering at all times. Uh, please also keep to the one-way system in the chamber, sanitizer and sanitizing wipes provided. Whether present in the chamber or virtually, please make sure that you only switch on your microphones when in person. Yeah, yeah. Those in the room, please note it's advisable when speaking. Excuse me. Can we just pause a moment while we sort out some audio? Uh, gremlins. Thank you. Sorry about that, members. Uh, so please make sure that you only switch on your microphones when you're invited to speak. Those in the room, <clears throat> please note it's advisable when speaking into your mic that you speak clearly into your microphone. If you have your microphone too far away, we find it difficult to hear. So please keep your microphone close to you on the desk and speak very clearly. Those who are participating virtually, please note it's helpful if you use a microphone and also speak slowly and clearly. Please also ensure that all other devices are switched to silent or off so that they don't interrupt proceedings. And obviously when you speak, uh, as part of the meeting, do feel free to take your mask off. <laughs> Only those members present in the chamber will be able to move and second motions and vote. Members present virtually may speak in the debate. Please would members who are attending virtually indicate a wish to speak through a chat message in the Teams meeting. Those present in the council chamber should indicate their wish to speak by raising a hand. I will ask my vice chair to keep a note of the order of speakers, both virtually and in the room. And we will try to de uh, address those all members equally. When we move to a vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, I will state that a recorded vote is to be taken. Members in the chamber will then vote electronically by indicating your presence by pressing a button and then selecting four or for, against, or abstain. The result will be displayed. Those present, including any members of the public, observing, or any public speakers, are asked to note that this meeting is being filmed and live streamed. So by your presence, you're deemed to have consented to be filmed and to the use of those images and sound recordings for a webcast. May I please remind members that when speaking, they should not disclose any personal information of any individual, as this might infringe the rights of that individual and breach the Data Protection Act. Finally, may I remind members you are required to address the meeting through the chair. Officers have confirmed that the meeting is correct and we can proceed. So, as our microphones are on tables, standing to speak means projecting your voice rather more. And in times of COVID, in interest of both safety and practicality, I propose that Standing Order 21.2, Standing to Speak, be suspended for the duration of the meeting. Uh, could I have a seconder for that? I'd like to second that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fane. Does any member wish to vote against that? Good, I see no one objecting. Thank you very much. Uh, so then the council therefore agrees that by mo that motion by affirmation. So now 
I have the pleasure of introducing Gavin Chapel Bates from Centre 33, who represents my chair's charity. Uh, I met Gavin a few weeks ago, had a very interesting conversation with him, and I'm delighted that he's going to be with us today. He's going to give a short presentation about the work of Centre 33. Thank you. May I welcome you to this council meeting, Gavin. Thank you very much. All right, we'll just bring some slides up. Hopefully the technology will work. Thank um, you, it is. Wonderful, excellent. Well, um, thank you very much for welcoming me today. My name is Gavin and I am the fundraising manager at Centre 33. Just going to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the charity and our work. So we are a charity that supports young people across, across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. And we work with young people up to the age of 25. So we provide practical and emotional support for young people and approximately each year we work directly with around two and a half thousand young people. Uh, we were founded as a charity in 1981 so for those uh, quick off the mark well that, it, that makes it our 40th birthday this year um, and in those four decades we have worked with approximately 40,000 young people. So I just wanted to tell you a few of the things that I think make Centre 33 quite unique and, and an important service for young people across the county. First of all, our services are what we call open access, which means they are available to all young people across the county. Um, they are also free and confidential. Young people can self-refer into our services, so they do not need a professional referral. They can get in touch with us in a number of ways whenever they want through their own volition and they do not need an appointment to call us, to text us, to email, to visit us. Now, when young people get in touch with us, they can come and talk to us about anything, and I mean literally anything. So whatever it is they may have on their mind, whatever issue they may be facing, they can come and talk to us. And we will then provide um, holistic support on a range of issues um, to support them. And we often deal with very complex needs from young people. So the majority of young people that come to us come with more than one presenting need. And through all of that, we are aiming to provide quality and good outcomes for the young people we work with. So as I mentioned, we work across the county. We have five physical hubs. So we were founded at our premises in Cambridge, which is at 33 Clarendon Street. But we also have hubs in Huntingdon, Peterborough, Wisbeach and Ely. We also run a number of specialist groups across the county. We work in quite a lot of the schools in, in, in the area and we also provide outreach support in various community locations. As well as, well as, as, well as our physical presence, we also provide remote support. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this is predominantly how we've delivered our services over the last 18 months. So young people can get in touch with us no matter where they are located without the need to physically visit us by texting, calling or email. Um, and this has been really useful service over the last 18 months um, because it, it means regardless of where you are and what your transport links might be and whatever anxieties you might have um, about face-to-face -face support, it may, means you can access us regardless. So going forward, we will be providing um, support via virtual um, delivery and also face-to-face -face support. So as I mentioned earlier, we provide practical support and we do that in a number of ways. There's just some of them on the screen here, but there are many more. So for example, we have specialist housing officers. So we work with young people who might be homeless or who might be at risk of being homeless as an example. We also provide emotional and mental health support and we do this in a number of ways. So we do this through our um, our physical drop-in. So when we are when we are open, young people can visit us at our hubs, and they can also call our helpline. On the screen here, you can see some of the um, things that we support young people with, and we also provide counselling, and we do that in our hubs. Um, we've done that virtually over the last eighteen months, um, and we also provide counselling in uh, many of the schools in the county. We also run a specialist young carers project. So this is working with young people who have caring responsibilities. So they may be caring for a parent or a sibling. And often these caring responsibilities will have an impact on their life and potentially 
a negative impact on their potential opportunities. So we're here to support them with that and we provide one to one support. We provide group support. We work in a lot of the schools and we also offer a series of respite activities and holidays for young people. So there are lots of things we try and achieve as a charity, but there are some sort of key outcomes that we hope for and that we're working towards when we work with young people. So we want young people to be emotionally healthy. We want them to be sexually healthy. We want them to be safely housed. We want them to be in employment or meaningful education and training. We want them to have improved financial situations and we want to reduce the negative impact of those caring responsibilities I just mentioned. So we are very grateful to have been chosen the Chair's Charity, um, which we are very grateful for. So thank you very much. There are many ways in which um, you can support Centre 33. Obviously, financially, that is important to us. Um, it costs a lot of money to run our services across the county and provide the support we do. And as I'm sure you can imagine, the need for our services has grown over the last 18 months and often that need um, outstrips our capacity. But there are also other ways to support us which aren't financial. So um, it is really important to raise awareness of our services, both to encourage other people to support and fund our work, but also to make sure that all young people across the county are aware that this support is available to them. And we also often have volunteering opportunities to help support our service delivery. So that was just a very quick whistle stop tour of who we are and what we do. But um, if there are any questions, then I'd be very happy to take them. And I'd also be very happy to provide further information offline after the meeting if anyone is interested to know to know more. So thank you very much. Interesting and informative presentation and for attending our meeting. Um, you're welcome. I'm going to ask if there are any questions, but you're welcome to observe the rest of the meeting from the live stream if you wish. Thank you. So has thank anybody you. any questions? Yes, Councillor Bridget Smith. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say I'm delighted that you've chosen Centre 33 as your charity. Um, over the years, um, you'll be aware that um, I've, my little charity I run, run in Gambling Gay is responsible for all the youth work and the outreach youth work. And over the years, I have encouraged a number of young people, some in really, really dire situations, to access the services of Centre 33. And I know they've saved lives, basically. You know, they've not just improved lives. They've, they, in some cases, they've saved lives. So they are a really, really important charity and one that deserves our support and uh, all, the support of all the people in South Cambridgeshire. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Do you wish to respond, Gavin? Well, that's obviously very heartwarming to hear. So thank you very much for those comments. And um, yes, I mean, um, it means a lot to hear those words and you know we do, we do everything we can to transform lives and certainly we do see some very high risk young people and certainly the need for the, the needs we're seeing coming through the door have increased um quite um quite substantially over the last year so uh, we will continue to be there for young people whilst they need us thank you very much and councillor cathcart did you wish to speak or use your thank mic you very briefly yeah this is obviously speak into your microphone councillor cathcart a very worthy organization i think it should be fully supported i'm just wondering how widely it is known out there because many young people actually are especially those with difficulties are isolated and remote from sources of communication and that's why you're in difficulties so it's just a question of how widely is it known uh, for people who really need it thank you thank you councillor cathcart gavin yeah, so certainly um, I think we're probably well more well known in Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire um, because historically we were founded over this side of Cambridge, probably less well known towards Peterborough because we've not been there as long. But we do a lot of work to make sure that all young people know who we are, which is, you know, we do a lot of work in schools, we work with professionals, we work with a lot of charities and other organisations. But we are aware that there are young people who are in isolated um circumstances or who might be in communities which are uh, further from um, services and support so we are working to make sure that we access those young people and certainly being able to offer blended and flexible services as we're, we're starting to do now with remote support um, online support as well as face to face support means our services can be more accessible so um, yes um, 
certainly it's there's always work to be done i think is is the answer but we will keep doing it but um, certainly please do tell people about us if if they exactly. don't know and that's exactly what i was thinking that we'll do uh, every effort have a, make every effort to uh, publicize your work i certainly will and uh, i'm sure now members are aware uh, this is the chairman's territory i know members in the past have been extremely supportive so i hope we can be this year gavin thank you so much for your time and uh, as I say, do feel free to stay with us or, or leave if you prefer. But thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So members, uh, I invite you to join me in a few moments quiet contemplation to consider the work we're doing this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, members. We move on to item one on the agenda. So, apologies. Uh, are there any apologies for absence, please? Yes, Chair. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillors Shrabona Bhattacharya, Tom Bygott, Tom Bygott, um, did you hear the first one, members? Shrabona Bhattacharya, Tom Bygott, Mark Howell, Steve Hunt, Dawn Percival, Judith Griffith, Nick Sample, and I believe Councillor Nick Wright may be late. He's not here already. Anyway, thank okay. you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dobson. Um, Councillor Cathcart? Uh, Councillor Clayton uh, is, is unlikely to join I'm, us this afternoon. I'm sorry, Councillor Cathcart, could, are you, who's, whose apologies are you giving? Councillor Clayton. Clayton, yes. thank you. Councillor Clayton. And uh, Aidan, Councillor Van der Weyer? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, Claire, Councillor Claire Delfield and Councillor Sarah Joan Johnson certainly agree with no apologies. Uh, there might well be other members of the group, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but that certainly this didn't sound complete. Sorry, who, who was the person you were giving apologies for? Councillor Claire Delfield and Councillor uh, Sarah Joan Johnson. Claire Delfield and Sarah Joan Johnson. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Van der Weyer. No others, right. Okay, so item two, declarations of interest. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If any interest subsequently becomes apparent okay. uh, later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? We have two, I believe. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, just that I'm a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly. I think in the past sometimes we've had to declare that, so I'm doing it now. Very much so, Greater Cambridge Partnership. And did Councillor Henry Batcher. Did somebody say Councillor Henry Batcher? Yes, please, Chair. Um, item 14A, I'm also a member of the Investment Partnerships for South Cam, so I need to declare a non-pecuniary interest. Afternoon. I'm sorry, Councillor Batchelor. You're precisely hidden by the Leader of the Council, so I yes, apologise if I miss you. <laughs> okay, so, um, sorry, did, you, did we get Councillor Batchelor's? So the minutes, members. Uh, members are asked to approve the accuracy of the minutes of the previous meetings of council on the 22nd of July, in this case. Are there any matters arising? Would you just like to raise them with me? Councillor Heather Williams? Um, Could you give so, us a page number? So in response to the question asked on the Arts Can Mark by Councillor Nick Wright on page five, and um, he's just asked me to say that there's been a slight omission um, that the leader mentioned of her role as chair of the environmental Wait, which committee. item number are you referring to it's Councillor Williams? Minutes. Yes, yes, which item number in the minutes? Um, page 5, yes. number 11. Point 11, whereabouts on the page? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, something one down, um, reference was made to the leader's position on the, on the environmental committee, um, so he asked if I could just have that included um, and then myself it's throughout there are occasions where it's councillor williams now given there are three of us 
it probably be best to have the the full name whenever um, I agree wherever it's used. Sorry, and I still didn't catch what what the what the actual point you wished to amend about was it the so the leader replied that there isn't the inclusion of the position the leader holds, which was referenced in the leader's response. That she's chair is it chair of the environmental. Uh, chair. Ah, so right. Let's just get clear then. So it's the one, two, three, fourth paragraph up from the bottom that says the leader explained that the council was still waiting for further details from the government on what the project would entail. Is that it? No. Chair, should we let the leader? The leader seems to want to. I'm sorry. Yes. Just, just. A Yes, do go ahead. A point of clarification. Um, I'm not the chair of the Environment Working Group for Ops Camera Art. That's uh, Liz Watts. I am the lead member for the environment on the Oxford Cambridge Arc. So the lead leader, the lead member, but I'm not the chair. That's fine. I'm trying to find out precisely where in the minutes we're trying to correct the minutes. Oh, I see. Okay. Are democratic services clear where that needs to be? No, we're not clear where it needs to be added in. Do you Councillor like Williams, would you clarify? Physically point to it, that might be quicker. But just tell us, what if we take the top part paragraph as one, and we count down, which paragraph are you talking about? Seven. So one, one that two, starts three. Councillor Nick Wright. Okay, and whereabouts, what line number are you saying it should be added in? Um... I suppose the second one, so the leader replied that she was the lead member for environment, whatever the leader's just said her title. Okay. So you'd like is. an insertion. After the first yeah. sentence, Councillor Nick Wright asked what the council's vision was for the Oxcam Arc. Well, I mean, I can't remember, I can't remember say whether I said it or not, so I don't know if I... I, mean, I, don't, I don't care because it's true, but I can't remember whether I said it or not, <laughs> unless anybody else can. Are we confident that this is an accurate record of the meeting? Can we check the recording? Yes, there's a recording. So if it says that in the recording, I'm sure Democratic Services will happily insert the reference that you're referring to, Councillor Williams. I'm sure Councillor Wright will be fine with that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, were there any other adjustments? Councillor Solomon? Thank you, Chair. Hopefully a simpler one. At the top of page 12, I made reference to the cost of the... Um, or rather, I'm not carrying Sorry, through the... At the top of page 12, I've got... Yes. Where, what paragraph? Second paragraph. Or well, the, the first full paragraph. The vote was taken paragraph. with one... Oh, right. Councillor Dr. Solon. Yes? In the, in the second line of the paragraph at the top there, the cost was £6 million. I think we'd all like it if the cost of, of reversing the universal credit cut was six million. It is six billion. So the point you're making is that the co sorry, the point you are making is that the cost was six billion, not six million. And that's, so that's correct. And despite this, it was affordable. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. And Councillor Bachelor, did you have something on the minutes? Yeah, thank you. Again, a straightforward one, a point of pedantry. In page one, Councillor Handley is marked as being present as well as giving apologies. So, I'm <laughs> <laughs> it's so lovely yeah. to be in more than one it's place at one time. Can I try that? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're impressive, Bill, but not that impressive. So, <laughs> Councillor Handley, could you advise us? Can you remember whether you were here or somewhere else? Uh, Chair, I was present. Lovely, thank you. So, you were present. So, can we amend the minutes to. Um, remove him from the list of those who've given their apologies. Lovely, thank you. Is that all for the minutes? Okay, super. So, right, so with those amendments, are we happy to approve the minutes by affirmation? Agreed? Lovely, thank you very much. So the council therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as amended as a correct record by affirmation. Thank you. So, moving on, announcements. Uh, firstly, I'm going to invite announcements from the leader and then the head of paid service, and then I have one of my own. Thank you. Leader. 
Uh, no announcements. Thank you. Um, no announcements. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, so members, there are two public speakers in relation to the item on the making of Foxton neighbourhood plan. Um, who've asked that they may speak on that item at an early point in the meeting as they have work and childcare commitments. I therefore move that the order of business in the agenda be changed to allow them, uh, to allow item 10 to be considered immediately after this item, in other words, before item 6. Uh, can I have a seconder? Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you for seconding. So, um, are we all agreed, members, by affirmation that I should move that item? Thank you very much. Uh, the Council therefore agrees the motion by affirmation. Uh, are, I don't, are there any other announcements? No? Nope. Right. So, with that, we bring forward the item on the making of Foxton Neighbourhood Plan. And uh, thank you for being, um, being there and being patient with us. May I invite uh, this, so this item, folks, is on pages 161 to 170 of our agendas, if you wish to turn to that. Um, may I invite Catherine Cairns, the chair of the Foxton Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group, and Councillor Simon Buggy, chair of Foxton Parish Council, to speak. Do go ahead. You have three minutes. Are you okay with the IT? In the, uh, yep, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I believe you're going to share the three minutes. We are indeed. Yeah. Okay, I will go thank first. you. Do go yeah. ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Simon Budgie, the Chair of Fox and Parish Council. Um, and the Council was delighted that the Neighbourhood Plan was so well supported at the referendum in July. And we had an impressive 32% turnout with 96% uh, of voters supporting the plan. Uh, the May plan is already proving of great value to the Parish Council and the community in responding to recent planning consultations, such as the uh, proposed travel hub at Foxton Station and planning applications from which our neighbourhood plan has specific policies. We, we've consulted our community about the benefits of, the, of neighbourhood planning from the start of the process over five years ago, um, and have been through several local consultations to gather evidence and feedback. And by taking the community with us on this journey, considering all their views and their comments and keeping them updated on the plan's progress. That's been vital in reaching this successful conclusion um, and the overwhelming support we got in the referendum. So we're truly grateful for everyone's, everyone in the community who has, has contributed towards this plan. Um, and this has been a great example of uh, community collaboration. Um, I'll now ask Catherine to add a few words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Cairns and I've chaired the working group that's worked to the Parish Council to coordinate the preparation of the Neighbourhood Plan. I think I'd first um, like to sort of have a reality check and emphasise just how much work it took. I think the process was far more complex and time consuming than we anticipated. I mean, it took, took us five and a half years um, to get from start to where we are today. But we were very fortunate that we could tap into a lot of skills and expertise within the village. Um, we also benefited greatly from um, successfully applying for different pots of grant aid to buy in specialist planning advice and specialist landscape consultancy because we prepared a landscape character assessment as part of the process. Um, these are specialist skills which would have been far beyond the scope of volunteers, so we were grateful that grant was available for that. And just to conclude, um, I'd like to personally thank your planning officer, Alison Talkington, and the consultant, Ian Paul, for all their support, their advice, and their timely input during what has been a very long journey, but a successful one. Thank you. so much. Uh, right. Councillor Dr. Timmy Holkins, would you like to present the item? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. Um, there's not really much more I can add um, to what has been said. I just want to congratulate uh, Foxton community on a successful uh, you know, neighbourhood plan. 
And as you've heard, it has been a labor of love, um, well supported by the community. Um, the area was first designated back, I think, in 2015. Um, so yes, it's, it's been a long journey, but they're, they're here now. And I want to thank them um, for again, sort of like showing the way really as to what can be done <laughs> when the community comes together. And um, obviously also our, our officer, um, Alison Turkidu, who has been like a rock helping communities to uh, come up with their uh, neighborhood plans. Um, I'm sure that the local member would want to have a word as well. So I will wrap up here and just say thank you. And I'm glad that we are able to make this uh, neighborhood plan and recommend that we make it as on page 161, item four. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could I'd like to invite Councillor Deborah Roberts as local member to speak on this. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. And to uh, my colleagues on the Parish Council and to uh, Catherine, um, a great word of thanks and congratulations. Uh, it's not been an easy road. It's taken over five years and lesser beings would have given up well before um, the, the eventual success, but these people haven't done. Um, Catherine and her team, including um, Parish Councillor Caroline Eilot, have really worked so hard um, and been so determined to um, get it right and get it through. And it has received um, a great deal of support from Foxton residents who really have appreciated, I believe, um, what has been done to, to help and protect their village um, now and in future years and decades and, and for future generations. So um, thank you very much to the parish council who have been very committed to, to this. And thank you to Catherine and her team and to the South Cam officer who has helped them so much. Um, well done, everybody. You deserve a large champagne. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. And remember that this um, decision uh, was actually made by the chief executive who took the decision to make the neighborhood plan in August 2021 because the time frame required that. And we are simply noting that decision, which is on page 161 uh, at the bottom of the page, 4A and 4B and 4C. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, did you wish to speak? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll try not to repeat what others have said, but I think we all know from, from experience on planning committee as local members how much effort goes in. So it really is a, a great job all round. And I think this is for Fox and particularly it was referenced about um, the things that are coming in the future. And this um, hopefully won't be just used, or vitally it will be used by the planning committee, but also those of us should be listening very carefully that sit on the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly and indeed the board as things move forward. And I'm sure we'll find a lot of support through the, the hard work that's been put in. Thank you. So members, we're asked to note the recommendations as set out on page 161 and 162, and I think we've done that. So we now turn back to, uh, thank you very much to um, you both for joining us and presenting, and congratulations on all the hard work that you've put into your neighborhood plan. I know how much work is involved. So thank you so much indeed for your assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we move on to questions from the public. These are on page little three of the agenda pack. Uh, are they? No. The supplementary pack, sorry, page three. Uh, we've received three public questions. I apologize, members. Um, we had received one from Mr. Daniel Fulton, but that question has been withdrawn. So we move on to question, the second, which is from Mrs. Linda Miller, clerk to Swavesey Parish Council, to ask her question. Um, So, uh, so, Mrs. Linda Miller, are you here? Is that you? Oh, I am. Here. I am. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing the question to be put from Swavesey Parish Council. I'm Linda, and I'm clerk to the Parish Council, 
And on behalf of the Council, I want to ask the following question to Councillor Toomey Hawkins as lead Cabinet Member for Planning, Policy and Delivery. Swavesea Parish Council asks, when will South Cam's planning committee be held in an open format with all attendees attending in person? Can <coughs> councils, officers and members of the public, in particular with officers attending in person. A Swavesea Parish Council is concerned that although the use of virtual attendance has been necessary and has enabled meetings to continue, technology does not always work and feels that it reduces the ability to interact fully in meetings. Uh, thank you, Mrs Miller, and we seem to be having some of that with us today, even though we're in the room. Uh, Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins, would you like to respond? Thank you, um, Chair. Um, meetings of the Council, Cabinet and committees, including Planning Committee, have been held in person and in open format since the 7th of May 2021 in accordance with the legal requirement to do so. From that time, all members of the public wishing to participate have been informed that they may do so either in person or remotely. Following the lifting of most national restrictions on 19th July, government advice has been to remain cautious. This is still the case. And the government's coronavirus homepage states, and I quote, Coronavirus remains a serious health risk. You should stay cautious to help protect yourself and others, unquote. Now, South Cam's council chamber, as you can see, is a dedicated room set up for council and committee meetings, which in normal times provides a highly suitable venue for meetings of the planning committee. However, this chamber is not naturally ventilated, but it is mechanically ventilated. The council monitors the CO2 levels in the chamber, which are well within the levels which indicate that the space is well ventilated. However, the fact that the room relies on mechanical ventilation means that other mitigation, such as minimizing the number of attendees, if their physical presence is not required, should continue. This is again in line with the government guidance that goes on to say that if you can't improve ventilation in poorly ventilated spaces, consider whether it is safe to restrict the number of people in these spaces or stop using them if possible. The chief exec as head of paid service has a duty of care to officers to ensure a safe working environment and is therefore taking account of this guidance in respect of the attendance of officers. Now, as you can see, the council has installed the technology to permit remote participation at physical meetings in the chamber. The meeting of the annual council had to be held off-site at a larger venue on the 20th of May because the government timetable for COVID restrictions prior to 21st of June required that events indoors could only be held in venues where 50% capacity was not exceeded. And of course, this was not possible in the chamber. Since then, meetings have been held in the chamber utilizing the technology which we are using today, which has been installed and which has worked consistently well for the majority of the 25 meetings held in the chamber to date. Just to end with this, that we have received much positive feedback about the fact that this council has equipped itself to enable people to attend meetings of committees remotely. Pre-COVID, there was frustration from parish councils and speakers who often had to sit through long meetings to wait for their turn. The ability for people to take part remotely has helped remove most of this problem and we have seen participation increase, especially from groups that were previously excluded because they could not attend physically. Increasing access in this way has been one of the positive legacies of the pandemic. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, Mrs Miller, do you have any supplementary question? Thank you. Thank you, yes, just one. Um, the Council would also like to know if planning committee members are visiting application sites yet prior to committee meetings to talk about applications. Councillor, could you turn your microphone off Mrs Miller? Thank you. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
Uh, we are not yet visiting sites. Again, we are taking account of the uh, coronavirus um, uh, recommendations, guidelines, and it's something that we will look at um, being able to implement as soon as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Councilor. We're happy to keep them updated as and when that happens. Thank you very much for your questions, Mr. Miller. Thank you for taking part in the meeting. Um, I now invite Mrs. Margaret Starkey to ask her question. Is Mrs. Margaret Starkey in the room or remotely? Do we have Mrs. Margaret Starkey on the remote connection? Mrs. Margaret Starkey, we can neither hear you nor see you. Can you hear me now, Chair? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Do go ahead with your question, uh, Mrs. Starkey. Uh, my, my question is uh, to the whole council. Given the South Cam's District Council's commitment to its zero carbon strategy, will the council take responsibility for monitoring the combined carbon footprint of both North East Cambridge Area Action Plan project and Cambridge Wastewater Treatment Plant Relocation Project. Currently, Anglian Water takes responsibility for the carbon footprint of the proposed construction at the new site, should it pass the DCO. But Anglian Water has stated that the developers will be responsible for the carbon footprint associated with the decontaminating the site at Cowley Road. The carbon footprint produced by decommissioning and decontamination of the current site will contribute to the overall carbon footprint of the proposed site, which is at Honey Hill, which is within the area of South Cambridgeshire District Council. We don't want the carbon footprint to fall between two stones. I understand your question. Thank you, Mrs. Starkey. Uh, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, would you like to respond? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question, Mrs. Starkey. Um, hopefully, um, you know, I, what I'm going to tell you will answer that. Um, the, the local plan proposes to regenerate the northeast Cambridge site uh, on the basis that the water treatment plant has relocated. And the redevelopment of that site in planning terms is a separate process to the building of a new wastewater treatment plant at the proposed Honey Hill site. So I will have to decouple the link that you have made in your question in order to be able to answer it. Now, South Cams cannot take responsibility for work being done on the development consent order process. The relocation is being done through that DCO process and is overseen by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, which has just recently been changed to the Department of Leveling Up and Housing. Therefore, the carbon footprint impacts of the proposed new site is a matter for Anglia Water to consider through that process and will be monitored through the policies that are agreed in that process. Now, Anglia Water would also have to create a sustainability appraisal of the impact of their development at that new location. And whilst we would like to hold their feet to the fire on this matter, we will have to wait to see the details of the DCO process. Now, back to the Northeast Cambridge site and the former wastewater um, plant. The owners will be working on the decommissioned site, the form of which is still yet unknown. However, what we know is that redevelopment of a brownfield site like that will require more mitigation than a greenfield site. And it is correct that the developers will be responsible for the carbon footprint associated with decontaminating the site at Cowley Road. So I will re reiterate, in planning terms, South Camp District Council can only be responsible for implementation of its policies on 
the Northeast Cambridge site. And the sustainability appraisal will consider the cumulative impacts of the area action plan and indeed the local plan with other plans and projects, including those being taken forward by other organizations, um, including that of the wastewater uh, treatment plant. Finally, um, the new development in the area covered by the area action plan will be subject to our net zero carbon buildings policies, which will require all new developments to be net zero carbon from an operational energy perspective, as well as looking to reduce embodied carbon from adoption of the plan. So policies for measuring carbon footprint associated with the construction phase will be monitored through the development management process using appropriately worded planning conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Starkey. Uh, sorry, thank you, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Mrs. Starkey, did you have a supplementary question? Uh, a comment, if I may, Chair. Do go um, ahead. Um, Councillor Hawkins used the term decoupling, and it's the decoupling that we worry about in not only this, but in other aspects of these two very major developments. However, um, we will be monitoring the sustainability appraisal very carefully. But if I could be total pedant, can I just point out one point? Um, the current site is not brownfield. It is a commercial site. A site only becomes brownfield when it has been left unused for some time. And this has led to a, a, an ability to talk about brownfield sites being regenerated and the effect on the green belt being uh, set aside. But thank you very much, both Councillor Hawkins uh, and Councillor Bradnam, for the opportunity to ask the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs Starkey. We move on to item seven, petitions. Uh, no petitions have been received for consideration at this meeting. So, item 8A, this is Cabinet from the 6th of September 2021, looking at the 2020-2021 Provisional General Fund Revenue and Capital Outturn. Uh, this is on pages 17 to 26 of our agenda pack. Uh, and could I ask the lead member for finance uh, to present the report on the recommendation of Cabinet as stated in the papers. Councillor John Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report reviews the provisional general fund reserve and capital outturn position for the financial year 2020-21, with general fund reserve balances as of the 31st of March 2021, and asks that we agree proposed changes to the capital program. Please note that this report concerns the revised revenue budget reduced for the COVID-19 pandemic. The report provides a statement of the year-end financial position and progress with the approved capital investment project. You will appreciate last year to the end of March because of the COVID-19 pandemic was a difficult year with expectations of lower tax yields and less commercial income. In the end, our Revs and Bens team did us proud, coming top in the country for council tax collection, and our business support team, by helping local business so quickly, enabled us to continue to be one of the top in the country for the collection of business rates. With business rates collection, we were half a million pounds down on the budget figure, but this could have been much worse, as many councils experienced. This outstanding performance in the collection of council tax and business rates not only benefited us, but also the county and the police and fire services. Also, our participation in the business rates pool with other local authorities in Cambridgeshire has once again borne fruit, with some £307,000 being received above that ballpark. As to commercial income, even here the drop in income was less than some had feared, and I thank the efforts of Ermine Street to support its tenants 
enabling it to minimise the effect of COVID-19 on its loan repayments to the council. In the end, as you can see from the table in paragraph 8, income and expenditure from commercial income was pretty much in line with expectations. Taking you to the table in paragraph 11, at the end of the 2021 financial year, we had slightly less of a deficit than we had budgeted for after income from taxation and government grants by £281,000, which means the appropriation from our general fund reserves to balance the books has been just, has been just under £2 million. The appropriation of £1.994 million leaves the general fund unearmarked reserve at a very healthy £14.5 million, demonstrating that this council is in a very sound financial position. As paragraph 13 explains, the original pre-COVID-19 budget assumed that nearly £1.5 million would be added to the general fund and that this was revised to having to take in £2.3 million from the fund to balance the budget due to the predicted negative effects of the pandemic. In the end, we've had to draw on just under £2 million. Turning to the general fund capital programme, the biggest variances in monetary terms have occurred in our commercial activities, where the loaning of money to Ermine Street and the further development of our commercial portfolio was affected by COVID-19 pandemic and the latter changes by, to the Public Works Loan Board rules. While a number of capital projects were also delayed and have slipped to 2021-22, we propose to take forward these underspends. Ermine Street can complete its mission to own 500 properties in accordance with its business plan and to allow us to maintain the funding pot for our continuing commercial investment strategy. On this last point, as we say in the report, the investment strategy is now under review as a result of the government's revision of the lending rules for the Public Works Loan Board. I therefore ask that Council agree to carry forwards of £2.081 million for the slippage of general fund capital projects, such as the replacement of street cleansing vehicles, and approve the additional lending of £5.237 million to enable Ermine Street housing to meet its target of 500 property purchases as described in paragraph 20. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. May I call for a seconder? Uh, yes, Chair, I'd like to second that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peter MacDonald. Um, would uh, anybody like to ask any questions? Councillor, Will Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a couple of questions and um, maybe a comment. I mean, it's great to see that Ermine Street is uh, still providing us with a sound investment and sound finance. Um, and also the work that has been done by officers to, to collect the funds and support businesses has been very um, well received and has been hard earned. So the officers do deserve full credit for that. Um, I have a question around slippage, and I'm, I'm slightly disappointed Councillor Wright's not here for my analogy, but slippage can be a little bit like black grass in a field. You see it, uh, uh, Councillor Peter Fain's nodding, he knows what I'm going to refer to. Um, so you first of all see a couple of bits here and there, and before you know it, the whole field's gone. Um, so what I would like is some reassurance from the lead member of finance chair that this slippage is catch, we're able to catch it up and that what we're not going to do is, is have further slippage and, and more slippage as a, as a consequence. Because if that is the case, and if officers need more resources, then what is the plan to, to deal with that? Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Councillor Heather Williams, thank you. Um, would anybody like to respond? Uh, thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, on slippage, um, when the report went to Cabinet, it was um, um, it, it went together with quite a detailed explanation on the various slippages. Um, so you can find an explanation for those slippages in that report. Um, I would say that most of the slippage has come about because of the effects of COVID 
and the difficulties that we have had in, um, uh, in sourcing not only materials, but in, uh, in also uh, experienced tradespeople uh, to carry out the work. But as you, you would have seen from the report that went to Cabinet, that it is intended that we will catch up on these slippages next year. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Councillor Granville Chamberlain, did you wish to speak? If I might, Chair, thank you very much. Can um, I say I'd... so? It's lovely to see you here. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, I'd like to ask what proportion of our commercial property presently remains with our tenancy in place and what the um, possible loss of revenue was as a result of that unoccupied property. Thank you. Um, Chair, what I, will have, I don't have that information at my fingertips, but we will um, respond to that. Well, so you, a, a response will be provided in writing. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. So no further requests to speak that I can see. Did, Councillor Peter MacDonald, did you wish to say anything? Uh, sorry, I forget, I meant to ask you if you wanted to speak in summing up. No, that's fine, Chair, thank you. Thank you. So uh, in that case, um, are members content to take this decision by affirmation? Agreed? Anybody against? No. Anybody wishing to abstain? Doesn't look like it. Okay, so this council therefore... Thank you. Sorry for the pause. Uh, so can, we'd just like to um, point out this council therefore agrees this motion by affirmation. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to take a five minute pause um, to enable um, people to have a comfort break and also to uh, undertake any uh, action that they need to. Thank you. Can we come back at uh, five minutes past three, please? Thank you.
feedback. Um, I just wanted to ask for the purposes of um, audio. Could, uh, apparently, the people listening remotely are finding the audio rather quiet. Uh, and as a result, we have had to um, turn the volume up, which is causing some of the feedback. So, members, including myself, whoops, can we try to bring our microphones close and speak clearly into our microphones so that everyone can hear us out there in the ether, please? Thank you. So, turning to item 8B, uh, this is on pages 27 and 30 to 32 of our agenda. This is Cabinet on the 6th of September 2021. Uh, this is the 2020-21 Provisional Housing Review Account Outturn. May I call on the lead member for finance to present the report on the recommendation of Cabinet as stated in the papers. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. This report gives the outturn position of the provisional, provi provisional housing revenue account, and I move the recommendations in paragraph five. Last financial year was, as we all know, and as we've seen from the revenue account, a difficult year, particularly for house building and repair because of the COVID-19 pandemic. You can see from the table in paragraphs eight, nine, and 10, the negative impact this has had on the outturn of the 2021 housing revenue account, and from the table in paragraph 13, the capital account. As a result, so far as the housing revenue account is concerned, our gross expenditure was down by £1.203 million, while our gross capital expenditure was down by £5.164 million. In these exceptional circumstances, I recommend to Council that with regard to the capital budget, we carry forward £1.822 million in relation to HRA housing improvements and £1.213 million in relation to HRA house building. And with regard to the revenue budget, we carry forward £35,000 to support the retender of the response and cyclical repairs contract. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor John Williams. Do you have a seconder, please? I believe we've yes, got I have a seconder. Thank you. Councillor John Batcher, do you wish to speak or do you reserve your right? I reserve uh, my right to speak at the end. Thank you very much. So, would anybody else like to speak? Sure. Councillor Ellington? Do go ahead, Councillor Ellington. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I just wondered uh, whether we could be assured that some of this bring forward revenue uh, could be used to ensure that council houses are insulated to an acceptable standard to meet the green agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. Councillor John Williams. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to the lead member for housing to respond to that. Thank you. Councillor uh, John Batchelor. Thank you very much. Yes, I can assure you that new builds are at the highest standard. And in fact, we are um, uh, with a, a big project coming up here at uh, Camborne, uh, we will be going for a zero carbon, which requires you know, very good uh, insulation. So the answer to that is, yes, we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you want to, uh, to ask a supplementary question, Councillor Ellington? I was really thinking about um, the houses that we already own rather than the new ones. It's very much easier to do new than it is to do old. Councillor John Batchelor? Yes, happy to answer that. Um, we're, we're working towards a re refit uh, program. We've just come to completion of an exercise with uh, Southampton University where we were experimenting with different sorts of refit uh, um, systems. Um, and from those, we're, we're now going in, into a another review which uh, concentrates on the costs. Uh, clearly, um, the cost to tenants are a key element to all this. So we're not ready yet to go forward 
but we uh, are working on it and uh, we will certainly be in a position to um, put this into the refit program with, within the next few months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Just <coughs> following a similar line of questioning, um, on the basis that we all know that a lot of our carbon footprint, the, the big issue is going to be from the existing stock and houses that are here rather than the new to come. Um, so I was just wondering if what, what sort of timescales are that being put in place where we envisage council stock being zero carbon? Councillor John Butcher, would you like to Right, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure I actually caught the full question there. What was that uh, how we're going to deal with the, the time the scale? The, the time, time scale, scale in which you've yeah, got cl clearly we've got we have five and a half thousand existing houses. Uh, this is a, a huge um, project uh, and a, a very costly one. So we're making sure that what we're going to do with is right and is cost effective. So once we've got that right in the next few months, we will set out on a full program to eventually do the entire stock. But this will be over a number of years, inevitably, uh, given the, the funding costs uh, involved here. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Councillor Ruth Betson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I absolutely appreciate what the uh, Councillor Batchelor has just said about the difference between the new and the old stock. Um, I just wondered about Camborne. Is that new enough, or is that considered old and has to be refitted? Councillor yep. John Batchelor. Yep. Thank you. Uh, the new build for, for Camborne will be zero carbon. Sorry? The existing. Yeah, the, exi the existing ones here will be part of the programme, certainly. But, you know, as I say, there's more than 5,500 houses, uh, a, a huge project, and, you know, it will take time. Thank you. I don't see any other requests to speak. So, uh, are we members happy to make the recommendations as set out on page 27 to 28? That's recommendations 5A to D. Agreed? Does take my affirmation? Does anybody wish to vote against or to abstain? Great. Okay, so the council therefore agrees the motion by affirmation. Thank you, members. Moving on, we come to item uh, 8C, which starts on page 30, 33 of our agenda. This is uh, the licensing committee um, from 7th of September 2021, the Gambling Act 2005, review of the Statement of Licensing Policy. And um, uh, uh, although I'm chair of the Licensing Committee, I call on the lead member for Environmental Services and Licensing to present a report on the recommendations of the Licensing Committee as stated in the papers. Thank you. Councillor Brian Milnes. No, thank you, Chair. I'd like to propose this motion to adopt an updated gambling policy. Um, once the... Um, excuse me. Just looking at my notes. There we go. Um, and I'd like to thank our new licensing uh, uh, officer uh, and manager, Rachel Jackson, who has uh, done the work behind this. As members will be aware from the report, uh, the Council is required to review its statement of gambling licensing policy every three years. Uh, so the new policy must be in place by January 2022. So I'm recommending that the Council adopts the policy with its minor revisions as detailed in the report, which will take effect in January next year. The licensing committee have reviewed the policy and at its meeting of the 7th of September, it agreed to recommend the Council that the policy be adopted, subject to the inclusion of, def of a definition of the term children and young persons. Uh, so I propose the uh, motion to adopt the policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Milnes. And uh, I would like to propose, I second the motion, 
but I'd also like to propose an amendment. And we have the wording, I believe uh, Jonathan Moulton has the wording, um, which relates to this definition of children. I will just read it out to you while we're, we're getting the wording displayed, I think. Uh, just to clarify, at the, county, at the committee, uh, it was requested that the a definition of age should be inserted for clarity. And the wording that we hope to put in when it comes up on the screen is, the Gambling Act defines, quote, child as an individual who is less than 16 years old and young person means an individual who is not a child but who is less than 18 years old. And we propose to insert that wording. Um, members, if I take you to page 44 of the agenda, which is page 8 in the policy, and we will insert that wording under the heading, sorry, I'll wait till you get there. Um, under that, uh, the heading, protecting children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited by gambling. Uh, there are two paragraphs there, the second of which says this licensing authority is also aware of the Gambling Commission codes of practice as regards this licensing objective in relation to specific premises. And it's proposed that we insert this definition of age at that point. Uh, the Gambling Act defines child as an individual who is less than 16 year old, years old and a young person means an individual who is not a child but who is less than 18 years old in there. And then we go on to, as regards the term vulnerable persons, it's noted that the Gambling Commission does not seek to offer a definition but gives clear guidance. So members, are you happy uh, to accept that amendment? Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to second that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Slightly later than intended. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, so are we uh, happy to take, does anybody wish to debate? Discuss, comment, no? So are we happy to take that decision by affirmation? Thank you very much. Anybody wish to oppose, against, or abstain? No, lovely. Uh, and as chair of the licensing committee, thank you very much indeed, members, for accepting that. Super. So we move on to 8D, which is the code... Sorry. I've, Sorry. I've, I think we just voted on the amendment. And we actually sorry, you're quite right. Yes, sorry. Uh, so on, that becomes the, the substantive. As well. Sorry, that becomes a substantive mo motion of uh, item no, amended. No. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. Uh, are we happy? Yes. Delighted. Okay. We're all agreed that that wording goes in and that the policy is amended as, uh, as referred to in the papers. Thank you very much. So, 8D on page 51 of our papers is the recommendation of Civic Affairs Committee from its meeting on the 9th of September 2021, adoption of the Model Code of Conduct, and this starts on page 51 of our agenda. Uh, as I'm chair of this committee, as well as uh, by virtue of um, my chairmanship of the council, but I'm chairing this meeting, uh, may I call on Councillor Heather Williams as chair of the Task and Finish Group, which presented a report on this matter to Civic Affairs Committee, to present a report on the recommendation of Civic Affairs as stated in the papers. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. So, um, so yes, the process of um, the code of conduct that was brought before us originally from the LGO was it came to the Antibody and Task and Finish group with myself, Councillor Van der Veer and Councillor Mason who looked at it. It's longer than the current uh, code of conduct that we have but I think we all agreed that it was um, longer in, in the right way. There is an awful lot more around bullying and harassment and also a bringing into the sort of 21st century if I may be so bold of um, the challenges that we face today. I think with that in mind, we were supportive of bringing this forward and recommended it to Civic Affairs, and Civic Affairs um, was happy uh, by unanimous vote. Um, we did 
discuss the implementation of when the Code of Conduct should come into force, and it was suggested that this should be in May 2022, although we would hope that members, of course, will adhere to these in, from the, you know, henceforth. There is significant change in the way that the interests are declared, and there will be three rather than two categories. It's an awful lot of administration as well in relation to those um, changes to the interests. Now, given there are district and parish council elections in May 2022, and it's normally common practice that the majority of parish councils do follow the district council's lead, it was felt that that would be the correct time to bring it in into force um, and also that full training will be arranged because of the significant changes in, in those. Um, and uh, I, th I think other than, than moving this forward and, and saying that I think it will definitely, definitely bring much, much better um, guidance, but it's not exhaustive on bullying and harassment. It's something that people associate with school. It doesn't stop at the school playground. We all know that. It carries on and it has no place in any organisation, particularly ours, and that um, I'm sure none of us would want to see that happening and therefore will adopt this code of conduct. Thank you very much, Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, I believe Councillor Dr. Dare Claire Daunton would like to second. Yes, uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm um, content to second this. Um, it started live as... Um, a recommendation from council that I made to the Civic Affairs Committee that we look at, along with uh, Dr. Douglas de Lacey, our former chairman, that we look at the model, at uh, the draft model code of conduct, um, which the LGA was then discussing um, and had put online. Very good document, cross-party support. Um, and we then followed that through at Civic Affairs. Um, so I'm uh, really content to, to second this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton. Would anybody else like to make a comment? I believe Councillor uh, Sue Ellington like to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Um, one of the things that really, really upsets me is when you're talking to a member of the public, public and it is inferred that somebody got planning permission or some decision was made in their favour because of backhanders to a councillor. I find this just totally unacceptable and I feel that this code of conduct is helping us to show that we do have rules and we do have laws and we do not do things for our own personal gain. And I really am very grateful to the committee for producing this new code. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. I believe Councillor Van der Beyer would like to speak. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, I, I was on the task and finish group with um, Councillor Williams and Councillor Mason. Um, and I, firstly, I'd like to thank um, officers, the range of officers who supported on um, as on um, the, all the aspects that, that we're looking at in relation to bullying, uh, and also on the um, new code of conduct, moral code of conduct. Um, uh, we are, um, I think, as you said, uh, adopting the um, LGA's code as a whole, which I think is, is great and um, very sensibly, uh, are, are, again, on a, a helpfully helpful advice, um, uh, adopting, uh, sort of implementing it from, from next May. So we've, we've got a little bit of time to. Um, uh, to get to grips with it, um, uh, because there, there are these significant changes, as Councillor Heather Williams highlighted, uh, around the um, definitions of the interests, uh, how we, how and when we declare them. Uh, the report goes into that, but I think we're all going to need um, to, to spend quite a lot of time um, uh, thinking it through, uh, getting our heads around um, um, how it applies to us um, uh, and, and, and how we communicate that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm very glad that we. we um, uh, should be hopefully able to, to adopt this um, now, this new code of conduct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Van der Weyer. Councillor John Batchelor. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I'm looking at page 65, item 4, disclosable pecuniary interests. I see this uh, 
in B applies only to your spouse or civil partner. Could I just clarify that that is correct and you cannot have a disposable pecuniary interest in wider members of your family? Thank you. Um, just could I ask Councillor Batcher, which point was that? I'm happy to tell you. Oh. It's four on page 65. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think uh, Rory McKenna is happy to take that thank legal you. officer. Uh, thank you, Chair. So through you, that's very loud. Uh, through you, that is correct. Um, uh, but disclosable pecuniary interests are codified in law, so that's actually set out within the Localism Act. What you will see, um, if members do approve the model code has suggested today that there are now going to be other categories of interests which will probably catch the scenario to which you are referring to and will tighten up the rules in respect of that there. One thing I would say is that um, obviously there will be full training given to members, um, not only in the lead up to May 2022, but also for those members who are um, re-elected or elected in May 22. Thank you, Mr McKenna. Um, I believe Councillor Bridget Smith would like to speak to the leader. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm just responding to uh, Councillor Sue Ellington's comment, um, and I think we all share your, um, your unhappiness about this. I think there's some stuff banding around on social media accusing me of taking brown envelopes as, as we speak, and uh, we just have to rise above this nonsense and ignore it. Having said that, um, I've been asked to take part in a uh, member task and finish task group at the Local Government Association um, on civil civility in public life. And I'll be very happy to report back on that. Now, obviously, you know, members of the public can kind of say what they want about us. Uh, the sadness is when it's other people in public life um, saying bad things about and telling lies, basically, about other people in public life. And so the LGA is extremely unhappy about this. And uh, Councillor James Jameson, <laughs> um, who, is the, uh, who is the leader of the LGA, um, is particularly um, aerated on the matter. So I will be very happy to uh, report back to you, to you because I know the problems go from the top down to the bottom and it's something that needs to be nipped in the bud. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. And through you, Chairman. Um, you know, I think it's a, a great deal of effort has been put into um, re-looking at this um, by, the, uh, by the working party. I'm just a little bit concerned that um, it talks about it being to help us as councillors, but actually I'm not quite sure how clear and clarifying it is to members of the public um, reading some of this. And, and going forward from uh, Councillor John Williams, um, I, I, I still think it's very hard to... Um, quite clearly understand uh, what we are supposed to be doing, or you know, parish councils, I've got a particular concern at the moment, um, regarding what is a pecuniary interest, what is non-pecuniary, what you have to declare, what you don't have to declare, when you have to leave the room, when you can stay in the room, when you can stay in the room and talk, when you can stay in the room and say nothing at all. Um, and I, I, I think there, it, it needs some work on that. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult, um, but in one of the villages that I represent at the moment, there's a situation where planning a planning application uh, was uh, in front of the planning committee, who then decided that they wouldn't take part in it, uh, any, any, make any comment whatsoever, as a member of the parish council would be possibly detrimentally affected, but it wasn't actually the member of the parish council's application. They were just somebody who lived um, uh, in the area. And, and I, found that, I found it very worrying. I'm still trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, so, uh, you know, I may talk to, to Rory about that particular one, but I'm just, I don't think it's as clear as it should be. You know, I think it needs a little bit more plain English um, and it's still a little bit too um, legalistic, um, and I've got concern on that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Uh, so no further requests to speak. Um, 
Oh, sorry, Councillor Cathcart. Yeah, uh, I, I must admit I didn't raise it in the Civic Affairs Committee, uh, but um, having a, I, I agree with the recommendation, I should say, but um, at six, uh, May is a rather long time, six months away. Having agreed and discussed it, it would seem uh, preferable to everyone to implement it virtually straight away, in fact, or very soon, uh, because it, it's, um, things can go uh, wrong or things can be addressed through a code, and it's nice to feel it's in place, as I say, having agreed it, but, you know, that, that's my feeling, in fact. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a very good reason for having it in May, and I agree for the purpose of neatness, i.e. having it coincident with new elections, I can understand that, but, you know, it's just it seems as if it's better thing now rather than six months time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cathcart. I think uh, our legal advisor will come back on that. Yeah, I think there's two things that I would say, and these have possibly been covered in the debate already, but uh, one of the reasons for suggesting a May implementation date is because there is a change in the, the registration of interests that will require not only the form to be amended, but for new forms to be completed. And, uh, and also there will be training required because the training is going to have to be implemented before the, the forms are sent out. Now, with 106 parishes, for instance, within the district, I felt that that was a, a cumbersome and an onerous task to ask them to perform at this stage when it will have to be redone in May 2022. I don't think it's a case that the current system is broken. I just think that this code will strengthen the existing provisions. Thank you, Mr. McKenna. So, uh, uh, does anybody feel, uh, are you content to take this by affirmation then, members? Great. Uh, does anybody wish to vote against the proposal? Anybody wish to abstain? Okay. So, that's, thank you very much. The council therefore agrees the motion by affirmation. So, members, we move on to item nine, uh, the medium-term financial strategy. May I call on the lead member for finance to present, uh, sorry, this is on our page 133 of our agendas. May I call on the lead member for finance to present a report on the recommendation of cabinet as stated in the papers. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this report reviews and updates the Council's five-year medium-term financial strategy, or MTFS, which delivers the Council's aspirations as set out in the refreshed business plan approved by Council last May. You are asked to acknowledge the projected changes in service spending and the overall resources available to the Council over the term of the MTFS, and to approve the refreshed strategy and updated financial forecast. We're doing this now before the start of the budget making process for the next financial year in line with best practice. Of course, we can't be certain about future government intentions until it's local government spending review, which normally takes place before Christmas. But this report does, however, ensure that the council is aware of the financial challenges over the medium term and the financial forecasts outlined in the MTFS assist in the Council's financial planning. Looking at the table in paragraph 25, you will see that this report moves us on a financial year from the MTFS agreed by Council in February, and therefore covers the period from 2022-23 to 2026-27. Comparing this report to the previous one, you will see that we forecast that the net resource position for 2022-23 will improve from a saving of £281,000 to £354,000, with forecast deficits in subsequent years also improving. So at the end of the new five-year period, we are now forecasting a deficit of less than £4.5 million compared to the £5.1 million in the five years to 2025-26. There are two main reasons for this improvement. Firstly, we had previously assumed that payment for new homes would cease after 2022-23. There are indications now that the new homes bonus will be replaced with something else. So given the level of new homes growth in the existing local plan, an additional £1 million has been forecast for each year from 2022-23. Secondly, the Fair Funding Review 
may not now be implemented until 2023-24. And because of this, the forecast for retained business rates for 2022-23 has been increased. It is assumed that the Fair Funding Review will reduce the level of retained business rates for this council. Of course, these gains are offset in part by a forecast drop in commercial investment yield because of the change to the Public Works Loan Board rules, which prevent investment purely for, public, uh, for commercial gain, and which I alluded to in a previous report. Please remember these financial forecasts are based upon the latest assumptions and modelling data, but these forecasts should be treated with, with, with caution as the, financial position, as the final position is uncertain until the provisions of the post-2022-23 spending review are known and are eventually confirmed. Sometimes this doesn't happen until the new year. Nevertheless, they give us a guide going forward and the scenario for our deliberations for next year's budget. There has been concern expressed that the current size of the revenue general fund reserve so if you look at paragraphs 62 and 63, you can see the alternative scenarios we have modelled, the most pessimistic of which gives us over £13 million to find by 2026-27. Clearly, we would be taking action to deal with negative factors much before this level of loss, but it does illustrate that in these uncertain economic times, we must provide for a much wider margin of error. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Uh, would anybody like to raise any questions? Councillor Bridget Smith? Uh, sorry, second. Yes, certainly. Uh, so would you like to speak now or reserve your right? If I may, if I may just very briefly. Um, so I actually can't remember a time when local government finances weren't mired in uncertainty, and it certainly doesn't, it certainly doesn't get any, any better. Um, However, I think, you know, the fact that we have weathered the storm of the pandemic, which is now nearly two years so well, is, uh, is extraordinary. And uh, my compliments for that go to uh, Peter Maddock and the rest of uh, Liz's team for, uh, you know, the, the very, very steady way in which they've steered, steered this ship through the most difficult times. I know uh, Peter and his team have I've probably worked night and day, actually, and uh, we've had three very, very important financial reports today, and uh, they, they deserve uh, much of the credit for that. So my thanks to them, and um, that's probably enough. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just um, some thoughts on, on this item, is that we've heard from the, the lead member for finance that it's an improvement of the situation that we saw at the budget report. Um, however, I would say it is not an improvement on the basis that just two years ago in the previous budget report, page 175, said that whilst the council has a record of identifying delivering savings through service reviews and value for money improvements, many such savings have already been delivered and it's becoming more difficult to identify and deliver further savings and efficiencies. And at this stage, we had a cumulative difference of three million. So it's dramatically gone up, it's come down, but it's nowhere near the three million that it was two years ago. So I wouldn't say it's an Im improvement. It might be going in a better direction, but when you put fa then factor in the margin of error that's just been told to us, it could equally go straight back up again. The reality of the situation is, in the last two years, it's significantly higher than it was before. Now, yes, I completely concur that Officers have kept the ship steady through COVID. There's that, you know, and they're, they're doing the absolute best in the situation that they've got. But it is down to councillors sat here where, what direction that ship goes in. And at the end of the day, those political aspirations of the council have to be paid for somehow. And that is not set by officers, that's set by members. We've just heard about the new homes bonus and that with the new local plan that's foreseen and the increase in housing um, means the increase of money. We won't be able to find this level of savings. We were saying that two years ago, so our only other option is to fill the gap with growth. More growth, more housing growth. Something that I'm sure residents would 
would argue that we've had quite enough of in recent times. So there is an option here, curtail spending on political aspirations, and then you might not need so many houses to pay for it. And on that basis, until you can show a real improvement, which is a reduction from the three million that we were at, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot support this at all, because we will have to see more and more houses, more and more growth to plug the gap. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Sorry, I should have said we're in debate. Would anybody else like to speak? And would Councillor John Williams like to respond? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, of course, Councillor Heather Williams is referring to a different five-year period. So um, it's not comparing... It's a comparing oranges with apples. And um, I think, um, yeah, it's... Well, it's not worthy of response, really. Thank you. Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, I believe you wish to speak. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. Um, this uh, financial strategy is, of course, dependent upon uh, us having a great deal of success in the commercial property market. Um, at this time, there is still a great deal of uncertainty about what will happen with uh, corporates requiring um, business space. Uh, we already have heard from the lead member of finance that we don't know exactly how much of our property presently remains unoccupied. And therefore I ask what degree of confidence may we have in the uh, performance of that uh, property, of those property investments, uh, given our lack of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chamberlain. Councillor John Williams, would you like to respond? Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I didn't actually say that. Um, I didn't have the exact details at my fingertips, I said, but I can say broadly most of our property is rented. A very small amount of it is, isn't, is, is unoccupied at the moment, um, but most of, I would say, probably 90% of it is, 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 um, is occupied at the moment and we are receiving rents from it. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Councillor Van Beyer. Whenever I've had occasion to look at these things, it's been pretty clear that the um, uh, costs associated with new houses in the district are, are greater than the, the funds we get either from new house bonus or, or, or council tax. Uh, but there is a myth uh, around, I had it sort of repeated, I think, in the letters pages of one of the papers recently, um, uh, that, that somehow uh, South Carolina District Council is, is motivated to build houses so that it can make money um, uh, and, and pay, uh, pay for council services, so uh, there's a little flaw in the myth there. But um, I mean, if uh, Councillor Williams has evidence that that, um, uh, that is one of the motivations uh, for us, I, I think it would be, be helpful to see it. Because, um, Point I, I've a personal explanation, Chair. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, go ahead. Uh, when I was speaking there, I referred to the lead member for finance's own comments about the new homes bonus and how Thank you. the increase of the plan. So um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm taking it from the evidence I was given, but then I'm not worthy of the member of this council. So, you know. That is not, I think, what was meant. But Councillor yeah, can I, can I John in here? Williams, would you like can to I respond come in here? to that? Because, and yes. can I remind members, all of your points should be through me. Chair, you will know that we have, had a new, we have been receiving money for new homes in the previous administration, and that the budget was... Um, and that going forward, the current um, five-year MTFS is based on the number of new homes that they put in their local plan of 37,000 new homes over the coming years until 2031. And that is what our budget is based on. It's not based on the number of new homes that we have put in, that we are proposing for the next local plan, it is based on the number of new homes that you, your party, decided to Point put in the current chairman. local plan going forward. I think Councillor Williams had finished. Could I just pause one moment there? I had. I wanted to go back to Councillor Van der Weyer to check whether his question had been answered. Would you like to make your point, Councillor Heather Williams? I, I would like to my point of information. Yes. Um, 
through yourself, Chair, mm -hmm. that I do believe the local plan is this council that was adopted by this council and voted for by, I believe, most people in this room. Um, so I think to say that it's you could be perhaps misleading the new party. You know, it was adopted by this administration and also that the figures were lower. For example, there were not 2,000 extra houses at Water Beach at that point, so that figure is not correct. There has been building above that plan, and that is what's costed into here. However, Chair, the point of information is that it's this Council's local plan, as voted on by all members. Thank you very much, Councillor Heather Williams. the party. Um, Councillor Van der Fire, can I just come back to you and check that your question was answered? I didn't really have a question, to be perfectly frank. I had right, a do you have anything further? Okay. So, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman, through you, Chairman. I think we need to start actually being very sensible, which I don't think we are at the moment. Um, in the past, this was a council that was very prudent and very careful um, how it spent other people's money. And I'm afraid that my opinion now is that um, political ambitions and uh, virtue signaling are overtaking common sense. And we need to actually get back to realizing that um, th these are difficult times and, and we can't break, blame it on Brexit. There are lots of, sure, lots of people in this room would love to do just that. Um, it, it's a, a, a worldwide problem at the moment. There's all sorts of things happening, um, suddenly happening, coming along board, what have you. And it really is a time that um, the controlling group actually tempered its ambitions. It's the old Mr. McCorber one. If you have a pound and you spend uh, 19 shillings and sixpence, you're happy. Um, if you have a pound and you spend 20 shillings and sixpence, it's misery. And that's going to be just the same here. You cannot spend money that you do not have. However good a cause you may think it is, um, it is not fair on the general public who are getting taxed um, all over the place, um, and we've just seen that the government have had to put um, the uh, national insurance up, um, and one can see why, because um, we are in debt in this country to um, a figure, a, a staircase leading to the moon, practically. And uh, we as a local authority should be much, much more prudent than we are being. Uh, ambition is one thing, reality is another and we should be only spending what is within our means and stop all this um, playing with other people's money. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Roberts, and good to see you, Councillor Nick Wright. I'm glad you could arrive. Councillor Bridget Smith, would you like to speak? Uh, thank you. I'd just like to pick up um, on a, a comment from Councillor Grenville Chamber, Chamberlain about uh, commercial investments. So an article in The Times on um, Saturday, September the 11th said, the cost of renting an office in Cambridge is at its most expensive as London-based companies look for a new space outside the capital to appease commuting workers. During the pandemic, thousands of people moved out of London in search of bigger homes and more green spaces. I mean, so, so, you know, the fact is that we have been incredibly um, savvy in investing in commercial properties in Cambridge because actually, you know, even though we predicted there was going to be significant growth there, actually, thanks to the pandemic, that growth has exceeded our expectations. So these have turned out to be incredibly safe and savvy, savvy investments. And just in relation to Councillor Deborah Roberts' uh, point, you know, we can't provide services of the quality that the people in South Cambridge are want without money. And therefore, it's incumbent on us on an authority not to be lazy and just rely on council tax and government handouts, but to be ambitious in looking at other ways of generating incomes so that we can not only provide services, but we can provide the grants to help all those volunteer COVID groups. We can provide grants to help uh, parish councils on their zero carbon journey. You know, if, if, we, if we draw in the reins and just rely on handouts and council tax, that will all stop. And then, you know, we will hear complaints from our residents. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Leader. Uh, Councillor Peter MacDonald. Um, thank you, Chair. I'll be, be brief. 
I, I, uh, like the leader, I was uh, really surprised by uh, Councillor uh, Grenville Chamberlain's comments about uh, investment income. Of course, investment income is uncertain. Pretty much all investment income is uncertain. Uh, but he was he joined me in a very productive call uh, with the City and South Cam's Task and Finish Group in business, where the indications of inward investment into South Cam's, including the requirement for commercial and office space is very significantly positive. So I'm really surprised he's, he's talking it down. Thank you, Councillor MacDonald. Councillor Neil Gough. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, just one comment I want to make, which is that, uh, as Councillor Williams said when he introduced this, you know, the, the medium-term um, financial strategy sort of brings together a number of elements, including the business plan. Councillor um, Gough, sorry, could I just ask you to take the camera? Yep. It, 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 brings together a number of elements and starts with the business plan. So if we are talking about, or if certain members are talking about reducing investment income, reducing level of expenditure, I think it is incumbent that they also follow through in terms of what aspects and what deliverables in the business plan will be sacrificed in order to make those changes. Because at the moment, the discussion is incomplete. Thank you, Councillor Gough. Right. Uh, I sent some dissent uh, about this, so I propose uh, that we take this matter by a vote. So we've had the vote, um, had the motion proposed and seconded. We're looking at the recommendations on page four, uh, page 133, items 4A and B on our agenda. Okay, so we're ready to take a vote then. So can I clarify then, all those in favour of the recommendations, as on page 133, uh, to press your blue button to say you're here, and then press the green button if you are in favour of the recommendation, and the red button if you are against the recommendation. Yellow if you abstain. Members, if your microphone tells you to log off, please don't go away. Um, just hit back and it'll bring you back in. Uh, so, has everybody had a chance to vote? Are we happy? So, uh, Rebecca, could you tell us the outcome of the vote? Or is it Aaron? Um, happy to do that, Chair. Uh, the vote has passed 18 votes to 8. Thank you very much, Aaron. So that's carried. Numbers. So is there a suggestion that people have not been able to vote satisfactorily? It does look a bit short, to be fair. Yes, Councillor Nick Wright only arrived part way through, so would not have been entitled to vote. So, <laughs> so I think I think we have got the right numbers. I'm sorry. I no, we've got one who hasn't. Oh, maybe that was me who was logging out. Okay, I think that's right. It was me who didn't vote. <laughs> I was so surprised by being told to log out, but I got carried away. So, okay, I voted for the motion. So, are we okay then? So it's still carried. Are you happy then, Councillor Williams, Heather Williams? Maths appears to add up in Councillor Van Rijn. I think I've still got some dissent over not being allowed to vote back here, but um, if that's the chair's not allowing a vote, then... Um, I made a so note of the point at which Councillor Nick Wright attended, and that was at uh, 10 to 4. Um, so I think he would not have heard all of the debate. 
Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. So, item 10, which was the uh, Fox and Neighbourhood Plan we've already dealt with. So, we are on to item 11, which is the Greater Cambridge Partnership Executive Board. Um, I invite the Deputy Leader to update the Council. Councillor Neil Goff. Thank you, Chair. My update will be very brief because there has been no meeting of the Executive Board. Sorry, we can't hear you Council. very well, Councillor Goff. Uh, my, update, my update will be very brief because there has been no meeting of the Executive Board since the last meeting. Thank you very much. Um, so, can we just note that? Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. I was going to say there has been a meeting of the Assembly, however, um, and I've got some nods from Councillor Solomon and Councillor Mills, who sits at the County in that capacity, um, in that the city access was discussed. And one of the things that I know I spoke about at the group leaders meeting is that um, when our board representative is um, in a meeting, whenever that, that finally occurs on city access, is that it's very important that it's not just, it, it has to, people have to be able to get round and through Cambridge, but also it needs to support those people trying to travel in um, particularly you, with the rural network. So that, sorry, Chair. Put it short. Thank you. Um, so that's what was discussed heavily at the assembly. Obviously, congestion charge was also raised, um, of which there was split opinion as to whether that was suitable or not. Um, probably minority one way than another. I'm going to get nods from my colleagues. Um, so that's an update from the assembly. Miss, thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Goff, would you like all, to say anything? All of the assembly feedback goes to the board, which is the decision-making body. Exactly. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Cohn, did you wish to speak? Uh, yes. And on, uh, what, on what matter? Chair, on the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Um, okay. okay, fair. Yeah, it was just very briefly. I just wondered if it could be taken back um, uh, by a, a councillor Goff um, with regards to cycle greenways. I have mentioned it in a number of briefings that we've had from the uh, officers, and I know they've got a you know a, a, an awfully large amount of work to be dealing with on the various projects, but it would be really nice to get some feedback on how those projects are coming forward and some time scales on those because we keep being told that we will be given information on that but it, you know, it doesn't seem very forthcoming in terms of time scales and I know residents have had questions on it. So, yeah, thanks Thank very you, much. Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Cohen. I'm sure that will go back to the, assembly, the board. It, it, was, it was raised at the assembly by Councillor Mills to my right. Um, and indeed will go back to the board. Thank you, Councillor Goff. I'm sure you'll report to us after the next meeting. Item 12, uh, that we note that update, thank you. So item 12 is the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority. Uh, we note that no further written update is available for this meeting and an update will be considered at the next meeting, but I invite the leader to give us any update. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. We've not received any um, any decision notice. Uh, just to very quickly romp through the last board meeting, uh, the board uh, voted to um, award £350,000 for an outline business case for Peterborough Station. I didn't support it because it involved two whopping great car parks, which seemed to be encouraging car use. Uh, the board unanimously voted against the combined authority purchasing the IMET building, which is the training centre which um, went bust after two years of, of running. Um, the, the proposal was that the combined authority moved into their, their offices somewhere else in Alconbury with no public, uh, public transport connections. Currently, the combined authority is talking to member councils about what space they might have uh, in order to accommodate the combined authority. Um, new chief executives arriving beginning of October, so that's going to be exciting. Uh, and my thanks to uh, Councillor John Batchelor, who's now serving on the Housing Committee, uh, which is having quite a large workload at the moment. Uh, my understanding from Councillor Batchelor is that they, uh, the previous Mayor's £100,000 house scheme has been axed. Um, there's been a, a letter from um, ex-Minister Jenrick 
um, that I think 18 million of the missing 40, 45 million is going to be coming forward for some um, already identified schemes. Um, I also believe that the um, transport strategy is being reworked and going back to housing, um, there's, there's been a big debate about reworking the whole housing strategy for combined authority. Uh, you know, South Cambridgeshire has a tree, a tree, a managed to secure a pitifully small amount of that housing money um, and you know something needs to be addressed there to make sure the money goes where the need is greatest in terms of affordability. Uh, so I thank Councillor Batchelor and also um, our rep um, Councillor Goff who serves on the transport committee there uh, for their efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Leader. Uh, and we note that verbal update. Thank you. So item 13, which is on page 171 of our agenda, um, I invite the leader to update the council on this report about the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Thank you. Uh, everything that needs to be said is written in the report. Thank you very much. Uh, members, do you have any questions? Yes, I can see it right. I, could, I need a list here. Whilst, uh, so I have Councillor Roberts, I saw Councillor Heather Williams. Was that Nick, Councillor Nick Wright? Was that? Yes. yes? And I saw somebody further down. I'm not quite sure who it was. Maybe they'll put their hands up in due course. So we've got Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Um, at page 172, at paragraph 8, second paragraph on that page, um, I'm afraid looking at that paragraph fills me with um, overwhelming horror. Um, the fact that now... Um, all the ten universities in the ARC are now planning together, planning together, planning together, both things, um, and that they say that um, the university's aim is to build a region into the largest line science is cluster in the world. Now, um, they may think it's great because they're going to get loads of money for their universities. Maybe they're short because the Chinese aren't turning up anymore or in such numbers, but the... Um, Councillor uh, Roberts, the, can I just, just be careful? Thank okay. you. But the, I mean, it's a fact. We know that China's having trouble coming. You go ahead with your... But um, the thing is, Chairman, that uh, what they are saying here uh, appears to me that it's going to have huge effects on this district um, a lot of the other areas, it, I don't think it will work particularly, but, but we know what's happening in this area, and uh, it's not good in uh, the future quality of life for our residents. Um, the universities may think it's, um, you know, wonderful um, and uh, looking forward to, to it, but there are the majority of our residents already feel under pressure um, and overdeveloped and are actually horrified um, and we have talked earlier about the amount of uh, housing that um, we are now seemingly going forward for the local plan. Well, I'm afraid that if this ambition of the universities goes on, we will be needing the FACOM project. Um, and, and this is something we ought to be fighting. I, we just should not be going along with this um, art business. Uh, it, it, it's a recipe for disaster for our residents. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. I think those are two separate things. Uh, we move on to Councillor Wright, and I also note that Councillor Cathcart would like to speak. Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chairman. And through you, my questions are principally to the leader. Um, first one is to do with the Environment Committee, which I think she chairs for this group. You were not here at the point. Lead where... member, sorry, the lead member for the environment group, uh, as she told us at the last meeting. Um, since that last meeting, the, the wildlife trusts have come out with the group of others that are involved in it saying what an appalling thing this is, and for particularly going to be for South Hans, uh, you know, with the routes that are suggested. And I wondered if she wanted to comment on those, uh, the response of the wildlife trusts um, and what she can do to protect our district. The other thing is she talked about 
you know, the responsibility of the stakeholders would have uh, in this project. Now, South Cams is a stakeholder in this project because it goes right through our district. I still have not heard from this administration any strategy or, or vision for what they want for this district from this project. We need some clarity right at the beginning at what they're expecting to gain from it or lose from it. So I'd like the leader to address those two points when that comes. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Chairman. You're right. Um, leader, would you like to respond? Uh, thank you. Uh, so in response to Councillor uh, Roberts, I can't speak for the universities, I'm afraid. Um, it would be completely inappropriate for me to do so. Um, in relation to uh, Councillor uh, Wright's questions, um, it, the chair of that working group is, uh, is Liz Watts, our chief, our chief exec, and we're very lucky that she's leading that group. Um, so I have publicly supported the statement that came predominantly from the RSPB. Um, I think they are absolutely right. I was disappointed, as was the whole of the ARC Environment Working Group, about the uh, lack of narrative in the consultation relating to the environment and the fact that the ARC Environment Principles, which that working group have worked incredibly hard to put together uh, with a large evidence base behind it, uh, did, were, not, um, were not referenced. When I challenged the lead civil servant on this last week, the response I got was that they didn't want to give any one group undue influence in the consultation. And bearing in mind that the working group includes representatives from DEFRA and the Environment Agency, that's all a bit of, bit of a nonsense, really. So they got a robust challenge there. Um, so, yeah, so I have publicly uh, supported that statement and I publicly supported it when I chaired the annual conference of Natural Cambridgeshire week before last. Um, uh, so, and in relation to what we want out of the ARC as an administration, what we want for South Cambridgeshire is what is in our, our emerging local plan. And, you know, we, what we have said and what, we, what will be said in our response to the consultation, which will be going to Cabinet on, I think, the 1st of October, is that we expect the, whatever the government wants, because this is a government project, and I gather it's being directed to out of number 10 now, uh, we expect it to be supportive of the delivery of our local plans and not to interfere with them in any way. Once it starts to deviate from that, then we will have something to say about it. Thank you, Leader. Uh, so, Councillor Cathcart. Uh, my concerns uh, have largely been addressed by the Leader. I was concerned that uh, we've just, uh, under an emerging local plan, which was considered by a scrutiny only a couple of days ago, who has highlighted the importance of actually protecting the local environment and improving it, in fact. And that's a key word, improving it. Um, uh, and my fundamental concern would be to make sure our local plan is actually aligned with our comments on the 1st of October to Cabinet, in fact, to make sure that we stress the importance we attach to the improvement of the local environment in a variety of ways. Um, and that this has to be fully highlighted and fully embedded in our response, and we need to follow it through on any subsequent discussions and consultations in a determined and coherent way. I'm sure that will be done, but I think it needs, that point needs to be made clearly at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cathcart. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid my frustrations, Chair, are very similar to that that have gone before. Within this report, nowhere do we see what the Leader of the Council, Chairman, is saying at these meetings. She's now been attending meetings for these Oxcam ARC for over three years. We have nothing at all in front of us ever to know what is being said. What is the representation from this council? So it, I would argue that we're really at a point where how are we meant to hold the leader to account if she will not share with us her actions and what she is saying or doing on this matter? Now, perhaps a condition of our attendance could be that minutes are taken and they're brought back. Anything would be better than the absolute absence of what there is at the moment. 
we cannot hold the leader to account on actions that we know nothing about. And Or is it, we've just heard, Chair, that um, we'll have something to say if it comes in conflict with plan. So are we to believe that the leader goes to these meetings and says absolutely nothing, um, only if it conflicts? I mean, we just haven't like got a give, clue. I think it's time we gave the leader an opportunity to respond. Uh, thank you. So you need to, you need to uh, direct, um, Councillor Williams, your complaints to the government because it is the government who have determined the way that the ARC is being run at the moment in that, you know, these are not, the uh, meetings of the, of the leaders are not public meetings. There is not an ARC website, and that's because of, that's what the government diktat is. So the government want, this is a centrally controlled uh, project. We have the most centralized government in, uh, in Europe, or we were in Europe, um, and, you know, that is what the government's determining. So the ARC is being run in exactly the way that number 10 and the Prime Minister, I now believe, want it to be run. So that's why these meetings are not public meetings. That is why there are no minutes of these meetings in the public agenda. That is why there is no ARC website, because the government have stopped the leaders group producing a website. So, you know, this complaint comes up again and again, and it is the, the Liberal Democrat leaders on the ARC who are constantly complaining about this. So it's nice to hear you uh, reiterate our complaints. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, I'll go on. Councillor Richard Williams. Point of personal explanation. No, you've had that question answered. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Point of personal explanation. Can no, I'm sorry. No. Okay. What is your point of personal explanation, Councillor Williams? My point that my question was about the leader. So is the leader saying that she is forbidden and not allowed to say My a single word? My understanding is the leader said. explained No, the clearly. leader has said that there is no minutes, Chair. We have not had an explanation why the leader of this council refuses to tell us a single thing of what she has said at these meetings. My understanding is that the leader explained very clearly that the terms under which this arrangement, that this meeting is held, are governed by the government and not by the leaders. Would you like to respond? Uh, very ha happy in one of our um, group leaders' meetings to talk for as long as you want about what's said in those meetings. Well, that's, it's the government who say it's got to be run the way it is. I cannot... Are you I saying cannot, you are gagged? Are you saying that you are commercially uh, sensitively gagged? This is could, we, could we chair. just have one at a time, at least, please? Councillor Bridget Smith, would you like to speak? I've said all I'm going to say on the subject. Councillor Heather Williams? I think we'll try again next time to get an answer. Uh, yes, Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, to thank speak. you, Chair. This is actually just a, a note for you rather than anybody else. Universities have been mentioned, so I feel I should put on the record I do work for one of them. Uh, although I do largely share Councillor Robert's concerns, and I don't work in the life sciences, but I thought I would make that clear. <laughs> thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, we register your point of interest. And uh, Councillor Peter MacDonald, I believe you wish to speak. Yes, briefly, Chair. Um, I mean, there's an elaborate uh, smoke screen being thrown up. I think everybody can see that from Councillor Wright and Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, we, as the South West Cambridgeshire Action Group, uh, fighting the plans for Thaken for development as part of the Act Oxcam Arc, have filed multiple freedom of request information, as they know perfectly well. All of them have been refused by the MHCLG, and we understand they were refused under specific orders of the Secretary of State. And the reasons that they were refused was it was not in the public interest. So don't come into this chamber and raise spurious uh, claims about the Oxcam Arc when your government is driving headlong and refusing all requests for Point freedom of, of information. information. Chairman. And less of the points of personal information, Councillor Heather Williams, you need to come clean what your government is doing. It's our, Point of it's information, our Chair. government, Councillor Peter MacDonald. Um, point of order, point of personal explanation, Councillor Heather Williams. Point of information, Chairman, it's the job of the opposition group at this council to hold the administration and the cabinet to account. Therefore, we are fulfilling that function. It is our job to ask these questions. It's our job to hold to account what goes on in national politics. I think, well, referring me to MPs or anything else like that, I am asking the leader what she's saying in a meeting. 
uh, Councillor, representing this council. Councillor and I'm fully I refer my right to, do to so. our standing orders, which point out that a point of information relates to and may only be made where a member is aware that the council has incorrect information before it on a material point. And I do not believe that is the case in this situation. We've been told very clearly what the circumstances are of the meetings of the Oxcam Arc. And I'm going to move on. Thank you. Now I'm moving on. Uh, okay, Councillor Nick Wright, did Thank you, you wish to speak? Well, my name was mentioned by Councillor Peter MacDonald who has got very red in the face uh, talking about this, I am perfectly entitled to ask the leader any question I like. Right, we can't have Especially... personal comments about people. That's really not on. No, you do not comment on people's Excuse appearance. me. We do not... Uh, Could I finish what I was saying? No, just a moment, Councillor Wright. Uh, it is quite correct that we should not refer to any of our members in, by, by, in that way. Carry on with your point, if you wish. Uh, well, that's very kind. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my point is that my ward is at threat from a station and 25,000 houses around it, which aren't in the local plan. Uh, it may be penciled in the local plan, but nobody knows for certain where the route is yet. And I feel that just as well as Councillor MacDonald, I am entitled to ask questions that concern my ward and cause anxiety in my ward. And it's quite right that uh, the leader should be in a position to answer those questions. And I think she answered them well, which I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wright. Okay. Moving on, we come to item... Oh, sorry, Councillor Brian Milne. Sorry, I didn't see. Thank you, Chair. Just very briefly, I want to add two uh, further frustrations. Uh, that come from the government in uh, respect of the environment um, on the Oxcam Arc. The A428 is a national highways project. They won't even adopt LTN 120, which is a cycling guidance that comes from the government. In terms of the East-West Rail, another example where the DFT in 2017 actually denied the possibility of that rail line being electrified and that was a certain minister called Chris Grayling. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move on to item 14. This is on page little three of the agenda. Uh, this is uh, appointments. Uh, member, your attention is drawn to, uh, sorry, this is appointments to committees and other bodies. And your attention is drawn to the changes in membership or roles for, com for the committees and other bodies as set out in the agenda. The first appointment requires us to vote. And we are asked, A, to note and endorse that the Chief Executive has appointed the Head of Climate, Environment and Waste, and that is Alla Bourdais Essen, uh, to replace the previous Head of Environment and Waste, Trevor Nicholl, as the Officer Representation on the Investment Partnership Boards. So, is there a proposal for that? Like that. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Oh, sorry. Thank you. And um, so, Councillor Henry Batchelor proposes that appointment as Chair of the Land Staff, the Employment Staffing Committee. <laughs> and uh, there is there, I believe, Councillor Brian Mills is seconding. Thank I'm you. seconding. Thank you. So, does anybody wish to make any comment? Actually, can I just uh, uh, say welcome uh, to Buddy Essa uh, as the uh, head of service. He's got a big uh, task ahead and uh, I'm looking forward to working with him. Thank you. And I would personally like to welcome him, uh, Bode too, and I hope he enjoys our company. Members, does anybody wish to vote against that proposal? Are you content to take this uh, decision by affirmation? Does anybody wish to um, object or abstain? Good. The council therefore agrees the motion by affirmation. Thank you. Next, we're uh, asked at B 
uh, to note any changes in the membership of committees and substitute appointments which have been made in accordance with the wishes of the leader of the political group to which the seats concerned have been allocated. So are there any other changes of appointments to committee to note from the political group leaders? No. No? Councillor Heather Williams? No, I'm going to look to Dem Services. I think I made the environmental group substitute um, arrangements at the last meeting. I can't quite remember when they were because I did it in between meetings. Um, yeah. If you haven't got any... Thoughts with substitute change have taken place by decision at some previous meeting or since then, so it would have been your recorded decision, so it can be reported today, certainly. In that case, I need to report that. Thank you very much. We'll report that uh, as um, noted. Um, and Councillor Cathcart. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Roberts. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, not a group anymore, sorry. Right. Um, right. Are there any changes to membership of outside bodies? No. No. Okay. Councillor Heather Williams, any changes to outside bodies? No. Okay, so questions from councillors. Item 15. These are on pages three uh, to five of the agenda lead sheet. So members, you are reminded that a period of 30 minutes is available for questions. Uh, I'm just wondering whether anybody wants to take a pause before we start. Yes, should we just take a pause? <laughs> five minutes, members, um, and we'll come back at... Um, uh, about half past four or as soon after the, as soon thereafter as possible.
on item 15, page little three in our agendas. Remember, we have members, a period of 30 minutes is available for questions. This includes the questions which notice has been provided, as set out on the agenda. And if there's still time remaining, after those questions of notice have been dealt with, we will deal with any questions which have been notified to the Democratic Services Manager in writing before the start of this meeting. So, uh, Councillor Sue Ellington, would you like to ask Thank you, question? Chairman. It says on the order papers. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, paragraph 59 of the uh, MPPF 2021 highlights that planning enforcement is a discretionary process. And it states that, and I quote, local planning authorities should act proportionately in responding to suspected breaches of planning control, quote, unquote. Now, this national guidance relates to all categories of planning enforcement, including those to do with compliance issues. And in terms of conditions attached to planning approvals or developments being implemented in accordance with approved plans. Now, the council's enforcement policy requires us first to seek to negotiate a resolution first before resorting to formal enforcement action, which should be seen as a last resort. The council is aware of a number of live construction sites where concerns have been raised by local residents about delays in taking formal action in response to compliance issues that have a negative impact on the community. And some examples of this include sites on Nostland and Lincoln. Um, it should be noted that during the first 12 months of uh, COVID-19 epidemic, the government guidance issued in a Westminster Ministerial Statement, HCWS234, of 13th May 2020, advised local authorities not to take formal enforcement action, including in respect of ongoing construction sites other than in the most exceptional circumstances. We subsequently wrote to parish councils on 9th of June 2020 to inform them of this. And um, as part of the shared planning service review process, the council will be carrying out a review of enforcement processes and procedures with the objective of delivering a more responsive service, including streamlining the process for serving of enforcement and related notices. And of course, I reiterate that this council recognizes the importance of demonstrating to developers and local communities that it takes breaches of planning control very seriously. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Hawk Tim Hawkins. Uh, Councillor Sue Ellington, do you wish to ask a supplementary question? Yes, please. Um, I'm really concerned at the uh, reputation of the council when the owner of a housing extension in my village, and this was a, a resident rather than a building company, um, which uh, had, he had uh, pr produced inappropriate cladding uh, on uh, against the planning permission that he had received, uh, it, he was asked to remove it, but then was asked to seek retrospective planning permission, which actually went to our council committee and was refused, but the planning department decided not to enforce that decision, so that cladding still sits there. And it seems to me that, that this brings the council into disrepute. It demonstrates a waste of money, time, and reputation. Thank you very much, Councillor Ellington. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, do you wish to respond? Uh, thank you, Chairman, and through you. Um, I am sorry to hear of that particular incident. It's not one that I am aware of. 
um, specifically, but I would ask you to please contact me after this meeting and let us have a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. So, Councillor Graham Cone, would you like to ask your question? Uh, it's as on the order paper, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, would you like to respond to Councillor Graham Cone's question? Pleasure, Chairman. Um, I think we do fully understand that it can be difficult to disentangle the various legislative processes to do with the wastewater uh, treatment plant need. And I think um, there was a bit of that with the public question earlier on. Um, it is important for us to differentiate between the functions of the two councils. Firstly, as local plan authorities in preparing the local plan and the area action plan. And uh, secondly, the role of Cambridge City Council as a landowner and developer and a partner in the hit it with Anglian Water. So these council functions are exercised separately. Now, the move of the wastewater treatment plan obviously uh, will enable the councils as local planning authorities to realize their long-held ambitions to develop the current site as part of Northeast Cambridge, which is a safeguarded policy SS4 of the current adopted local plan 2018. However, the decision to move the wastewater treatment plant was made by Anglia Water in partnership with Cambridge City Council in their capacity as a land owner. And due to the successful HIFID, the local plan and the AAP are being prepared on the basis that the wastewater treatment plant will be relocated, but it's not a requirement of the local plan or the AAP. The relocation of the wastewater treatment plant would, however, unlock a brownfield site that our evidence shows is very sustainable location for development. Now, including the site in the two plants at this stage will ensure that future development in this area is brought forward in a comprehensive and coherent manner. And the local development scheme setting out the plan making process for both the plan, local plan and the AAP is clear that the plans will only progress to the latter formal stages when the development consent order for the relocation of the wastewater plant is determined. So the um, Anglia Water DCO process is entirely separate statutory planning process from the local plan, and it will be determined under different legislation. So it is not a project or a proposal within the scope of the local plan. And so it will be inappropriate to include it as part of the local plan proposals and consultation. However, the relocation of the wastewater treatment plant will be considered in the sustainability appraisal for the draft local plan as a project being brought forward by another body as part of assessing the cumulative impact of the local plan. And of course, in relation to the green belt issue, we understand that Anglia Water will be making a case for very special circumstances to locate the new wastewater treatment plant within the Green Belt. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Councillor Graham Cohen, do you wish to have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, I would, Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the lead member for her um, answer. Um, my supplementary question essentially is that, um, that the Council does accept that the only reason the water treatment plant is moving is because of the HIF bid, which um, the lead member alluded to, that there is no operational need for um, Anglian Water to move the water treatment plant. And we could pull out of the HIF bid if we wanted to. Can I just clarify that, if I may, Chair? We were not part of the HIF bid was Cambridge City Council and Anglia Water in their respective, um, in their capacity as the landowners. So 
I'm afraid that you know there's nothing that we can do to pull out of <laughs> the hip bit. Sorry. Oh, I thought we were signal trees. So, Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins, thank you for that response. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, moving on um, to the third question, then, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, uh, would you like to ask your question? Thank you very much, Chair. My question is as on the agenda. Thank you very much. I invite Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins to respond. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, in answer to your question, we, in 2019, five requests, we received five requests and made one TPO order. In 2020, there were 33 requests. Uh, four were made, two are under construction, construction, sorry, consideration. <laughs> and um, we're waiting information on two more. And in 2021, so far, uh, we've had 12 requests and uh, five are in advanced stages of being made. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, just Councillor Tim, uh, Councillor Hawkins, could you just clarify, you said there were, in 2000, there were five requests and how many made? 2019, five requests and one made. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Uh, yes, the thank, thank you very much to the uh, lead cabinet member um, for, for those numbers. Um, the, the 2020 numbers are, um, are, are a little worrying. Um, there are just two points really I wanted to make um, it as a follow-up. One, could we have an assurance that the council will communicate clearly with people who make a tree application, tree protection order, um, and, and what the outcome of that is? I think a number of people I know have uh, made applications and they've heard nothing else about it so they don't know whether it was accepted um, or rejected so I think if we could communicate better that would be fine um, and the second question is is just to, um, the second point is just to go back to something I made uh, a point I made a few months ago is the cabinet member confident that we have the resource capacity in place to allow the tree te trees team to deal with all of these applications quickly um, and efficiently and particularly actually to conduct site visits and make sure that the uh, protection orders that are made um, are, uh, are properly assessed, or that the applications that are made are properly assessed. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, do you want to respond? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I take your uh, message, uh, Councillor Richard Williams, um, in terms of communications. I will check with the trees team and um, see how that uh, I guess refer back or communications back to those who make requests is being done and improve it as necessary. On the issue of resource, yes, um, we have um, put in an additional uh, person resource to deal with administration of tree applications, which means the tree officers themselves um, have uh, increased capacity to deal with the actual tree issues. So I am confident that we have enough resource dealing with uh, trees in the planning service. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins. Okay, so um, we can now move on to the questions received after the deadline of seven clear days notice. Uh, so we have the exciting prospect of Councillor Rebecca Dodson delving into the box of questions. It's like Christmas. And our legal advisor will check that the question is acceptable to the committee, to the council. Yeah. Okay, so. Shall we? So the question is, I don't know who it's from. Uh, is, sorry, do we need to know who it's from? It's from Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Is, is the leader aware and or has the leader or any member of the cabinet met with any developers about proposals for major developments that have not been shared with all members of this council, as was the case with the 25,000 house proposal by FACOM? Yeah. 
Peter, would you like to respond to that? So the one meeting that happened with Fakenham was with, it, with the Director of Planning in attendance. Lisa, uh, could you just move the camera? Sorry, it was with, a, with the Director of Planning in attendance, and that was days, as you know, because you've been told, days before they went public um, with, of with, their, chairman, with their scheme. Would you put, a. And the, the answer to the rest of your question is no. Sorry, Councillor Williams, would you just be able to see it, just listening through? Sorry, did you finish, Rita? Uh, so, and the raised a point of order, Chair. What would you like to ask as a point of order? Point of order under 1217A, a direct oral answer. The uh, and just, question and was about. Yes, just wait a moment. I'm not I check 12A. 12 what was the point of order? 12.17A. Just bear with me. Mean 12.7. Sorry, 7A, 7, 7 direct oral answer. Apologies. Point that you're asking. Point is that the question that I have asked is about other proposals, and yet the, um, the leader is referring to past events in relation to the example that was given, but that is not the question, and therefore she's not constituting a direct impression oral is, answer. Sorry, Councillor Williams. Uh, my impression is that the leader was answering the question that I read out. Uh, she had undertaken to answer the question, and it's not my impression that she was avoiding the issue. She was answering the question that you asked. Sorry, uh, so Councillor Williams, you interrupted me before I'd finished That's answering, exactly. but I did have to pick up on your your um, slightly veiled accusation about uh, meetings with uh, Fakem. So the answer is no. Thank you. Uh, did you have a supplementary? Thank you. Um, so yes, I, I did. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, Chair. There haven't been any further. And just for clarity, I'd just like to clarify what the leader was saying, because I'm aware of a meeting <coughs> that was a few days before, but I'm also aware of a meeting that the leader had two months before the second proposals became live, and hence the reason, I believe it was the 25th of September, 27th of September, something along there. Um, so... You know, that's the reason why the question's been asked, to make sure there's nothing else that we're not aware of. Um, and if there isn't, then that's good news, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Leader. Would you like to respond? I don't, I don't think there was a question. Do I think, Rory, the question was, question. was had you, were you aware of that? No, I answered that, but there wasn't, a supplement. Rory, there wasn't a supplementary question, was there? I tried to clarify the September date because I, I was clarifying your response. Did you say you Thank only you. met them few days before the announcement or did you meet them in the September as Councillor well? Councillor Heather Williams, will you just bear with me? The question, the supplementary question was that people had been aware of a meeting two months before, so around about the 25th, 27th of September. How would you like to respond to that? The only meeting I've had with Bacon was with Stephen Kelly in attendance. Fair enough. So the Point of meeting. information, Chair, I have, no, I'm sorry. I have an That's email from Bridget Smith saying to the contrary. That was... Oh, my God. Um, perhaps you would be so kind as to send that email to Councillor Bridget Smith and she can send you a written reply, if there's some different reply that she can I'm give. I'm happy to accept that, Chair. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Next question, then. Yes, Are we doing... Uh, yes, we've got time. Okay. Oh, so this is the one uh, that was listed on the agenda, should we have time to take it. So this is received from Councillor Dr. Ian Solemn. Did you want to ask your question? I'm sorry, I read the last one, but did you want to ask your question? Or are you happy I read it? Or? Uh, well, it's written in the order paper, so I don't think... Okay, of course, need... yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's written on the order paper, um, if somebody uh, can find it. As written. Thank you. So, um, yes... Can anybody remind me where it is in the order papers? 15D. 15D. Thank you very much. Super. Right. So, anybody wish to comment on that? Yes. Councillor John Williams. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, the £20 universal credit uplift announced as part of the government's COVID response will come to an end on the 6th of October, returning UC payments to pre-COVID levels. Before this happens, we have already, through our discretionary housing payments and hardship support funds, helped over 200 residents with the total financial assistance awarded so far in 2021, exceeding £107,000. Going forward, the removal of the uplift can only make the situation worse. Those residents who now or in future find it difficult to pay their bills, including council tax and rent, we would ask that they contact us as soon as possible to discuss the support options available for their circumstances. We offer a range of support options for those struggling financially, including discretionary housing payments, which provide financial support towards housing costs, the Council Tax Hardship Fund, which aims to provide support to those who are struggling financially as a result of COVID, support and advice from our Welfare and Money Maximisation Officer, and signposting to external support and advice agencies, such as Citizens Advice, which we financially support to give advice to our residents. Details of how to access this help can be found on our website. Early contact is key to preventing debt problems from escalating, so residents that may be experiencing difficulties should make contact with us as soon as possible. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Um, I believe Councillor Bill Handy would like to... No, it's a supplementary. Can I, can I have my supplementary, please? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for responding to uh, Councillor Ian Solomon. Supplementary. Supplementary, sorry, yes. Did, would anybody... Um, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Dr Ian Solomon, do you have... Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, uh, through you, thank, thank you to the lead member for finance for, for, for that answer. Obviously, over the last 18 months, the communities in South Cambridgeshire have, have come together fantastically to be the sort of the lead response on the ground, uh, looking after the vulnerable people in their, their communities. And with this cut, we're going to see an impact on our communities again. I wonder if we could just make sure that that information that you've just shared is distributed to those those groups that are still still very active in our group in our community. So to, uh, uh, to make sure that it's maximised, that that information is got to the people that need to know. Thank you. Councillor Dr um, John Williams. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Yes, absolutely. Um, the Council has a weekly update to all South Cam's COVID community groups and parish councils, and any helpful information um, will be inserted in the next edition, which should be going out next Thursday. And similarly, we have a parish e-bulletin, uh, which will be issued before the end of the month, and we'll make sure that, that goes, it goes in that as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Did, did Councillor Brian Milnes wish to ask a question? No, I just wanted to point out that uh, in the news today, uh, the lifting of evictions, um, the ban on evictions has come into place. Chairman, this isn't a debate. Oh, then I apologise. Apologise. I apologise. I, 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 I was thrown because I was understood that Councillor Ian, um, Councillor Brian Mills was going to ask a question. I apologise. My mistake. That's, we've we've come very close to the end of petition time. Okay. We'll move on to the motions. That's on pages four and five of the agenda lead sheets. You're reminded that a maximum period of 30 minutes is allowed for each motion to be moved, seconded and debated, including dealing with any amendments. At the expiry of the 30 minute period, debate will cease immediately and the mover of the original motion, or if the original motion has been amended, the mover of that amendment, now forming the substantive motion, will have the right of reply before the motion or amendment is put to the vote. So, moving on. Uh, standing in the name of Councillor Dr. Ian Solom. Councillor Solom, uh, sorry, Councillor Dr. Ian Solom, I invite you to speak. Thank you, Chair. Council, 
Our area is facing the water crisis. It's invisible to many. We haven't had the need for any water restrictions. And actually, the long-term average annual rainfall has been fairly constant. But look more closely, and the evidence is there. In the reduction of flows in our spring-fed chalk streams, in the more frequent drying out of local wetlands, and in the loss of the rare and precious habitats and species that those changes bring about. Now, we know that the, the problem is over-abstraction of the chalk aquifer. Estimates suggest that abstraction reduces the CAM, for example, to about half its natural flow. But abstraction has long been the main source of public water supplies in our area. So if we're going to tackle this, we're going to have to tackle that dependency and put into action plans to restore and enhance those habitats affected. Now, I would dearly love that this was something entirely within the control of us as a district council. And we can have some impact driving new development to incorporate rainwater harvesting and recycling of grey water. But we live in a complex world of water resource management. The Environment Agency and Ofwat, Cambridge Water and Anglian Water and other water companies. And their collaboration in organisations like Water Resources East. We should be somewhat relieved that many, if not all, of those organisations recognise the problems that we face. They have plans to reduce water use through metering and dealing with leaks in the system. And they are developing plans to improve water catchment management and invest in new supply infrastructure. But sadly, they're not moving fast enough. The crisis is with us now. And in a, such a complex system of water resource planning and management, it's only national government that can take the lead in driving the change that needs to happen. They control the stick of regulation, and they can also provide the carrot of supporting that upfront investment that the water companies are going to have to make. Our area should not have to wait 15 years or possibly more for new supply infrastructure. And there are certainly species and habitats that simply can't wait that long. They will no longer be with us. I know that under the Liberal Democrats, this council will do all that is within its power to do to protect those precious habitats. But we need the government to step up. And so I all urge all members to back this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a seconder, Councillor? Councillor Pippa Halings. Thank you. Councillor Halings, uh, could you confirm? And whether you wish to speak now or reserve your right? I can confirm that, Chair, and I'll reserve my right to speak at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the mo motion is open for debate. And we have firstly Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Well, it is good to uh, at last um, see the Liberal Democrats supporting the local MP. Um, who has been um, trying extremely hard and very, been very vocal about it in his concerns about the chalk streams in South Cambridge and the uh, dire situation that they are facing. Um, however, for the old bods like me, um, who've been on this council for over 30 years, um, this problem is nothing new. That we've always had concerns. The, the fact is that uh, the water comes in, uh, it goes up the mountains of Lancashire and it drops most of its rain there. So by the time it gets to East Anglia, there's not all that much left. Um, and that's always been the case. And it was always one of the reasons that old members of this council used to be very concerned about development because we always knew that uh, mass development of um, South Cambridgeshire was not able to be sustained because there would not be the water. Uh, and you may um, do dances to the, rain, uh, to the rain gods, but you won't make it happen. Uh, and I think it's quite um, hypocritical um, for a group, a liberal democrat group, who calls itself green to its, its bottom of its agenda, um, actually 
The answer is in your hands. You don't have to develop the sort of numbers that you are doing. The more housing that you develop, the greater will this problem be. Your answer is quite simple. Stop putting concrete down. You're estimating 49,000 houses in the next 20 years. You don't have to build anything near that. You are going above and beyond what you are charged by the government to do. How hypocritical of you to come here doing your virtue signaling and, and talking about we have to do something now, it's so critical, blah, blah, blah. The answer is in your hands. Stop going along with the development of the sort of numbers that you are talking about. If you bring water in, you're bringing it in from other areas. What's going to happen to those Professor other Roberts, areas? Could I just remind you to speak through the chair and that to wind up, please? Thank you, Tip. Sorry, Chairman. Through, through the chair. Um, it's hypocritical. You're just virtue signaling. You're just, you know, you've got elections coming up in May. I'm sure we'll read this all over. But the answer is actually in uh, the Liberal Democrats' hands, um, Chairman. Um, stop going along with this overdevelopment. Um, it's, it's just a nonsense. And, you know, people can see through what you're up to. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. We have other speakers. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, I think um, I, I'm hopefully not going to surprise uh, Councillor Solemn in that I will support this because on environmental issues, we've always tried to seek um, cross-party agreement. Um, however, you know, I felt that the words that Councillor Ian Solemn made were... Um, everything that would suggest a minimum growth scenario in the housing numbers. So I think you spoke very well about the need and, and everything else that we have here. And I do think there is merit in what Councillor Roberts is saying. The more we build, the bigger problem this is going to be. That's the reality. The numbers foreseen in the next local plan chair could mean, I think it's around 1.4 billion litres of water a, a year. That's, that's an that's additional to where we are now and on the, on the way up there. So we can't ignore that. And we do have to reflect that in what we're doing. In the papers it, that it were sub submitted and we've all seen, it does say that we're going above and beyond as a council in that local plan proposal. So I think it's, um, I would stress that um, if the administration as Councillor Solomon has said, really want to do all they can, that they really look at the issue of those numbers again. Supportive of the motion, but I think we do have to look at our own and reflect on our own actions as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Rich, Dr Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, look, I mean, if you're going to build this many houses, yes, we've got a problem, and yes, we need to get some water. Um, so, um, you know, okay, but the simple solution is don't build 12,000 houses more or don't propose to build 12,000 houses more than the standard method says that you have to. Now, that was greeted with much hilarity um, by some members um, opposite earlier, um, but, you know, read the South Oxfordshire, read, read the inspector's report for the South Oxfordshire local plan. You are going to have to prove to the inspector that exceptional circumstances apply to depart from the standard method. Councillor Dr Richard Williams, remind to speak to the chair. Thank the you. council, through you, Chair, the council will have to make the case to the inspector that exceptional circumstances apply to justify departing from the standard method. The council will have to make the case that environmental factors do not impose a constraint on development. Greenbelt is another one, actually. Um, these are in the NPPF. You are going to have to make the case. So I know the argument is we've got this document, which is called an objective uh, needs assessment and it says we must do this that is not it is not as straightforward as that you have to make the case and if that is the case why are we here why do we just not contract out what's in our local plan to some planning develop um, some planning consultants because if it really is the case 
as the council uh, leadership would have us believe, that we simply have no choice because we have this document, which was drawn up by some people who we don't know and who are not accountable to the South, uh, the electors of Cam Cambridgeshire. We therefore have no choice. What are we doing here? Why do we bother voting on a local plan? There is no point. It is because that is not the case. They supply us with evidence. We, as a council, have to take the judgment. And we could take a judgment that water, as we all know, as the evidence before us from November tells us that to accommodate the medium level growth which you're proposing, we need regional level solutions to accommodate the minimum growth, the government number, we do not. That is in your own report. So, yes, if you're going to build, we need to do something. But there's a simple solution, and it is in your hands. Don't build 12,000 houses more than you need to. Thank you. Councillor Nick Wright. Thank you, Chairman. And I would propose an amendment, but I know I'm going to lose it. So I'm not going to take up more time. But really, this letter is going to the wrong person. It ought to go to the lead member on planning, your lead member on planning, and our director of planning, because you have so much influence on water for all the reasons that you've already heard too many houses in the new local plan, too much stress on the water supplies, all that. And, you know, you have your own, you know, protection in our advisory group, Councillor Pippa Haling's advisory group, which she's the lead member on, that could be looking at protecting water in this district. You know, it is in your own hands. You know, you are in control of this council. You have to make the developers squeak when they're building by putting conditions on that will protect our water supplies. And it's no good just saying, wringing your hands all the time and saying, well, it's the government's fault. You are in control of the development that is happening here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Thank you. Yes, I, I support this motion um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the chalk streams are under threat and actually it affects an awful lot of villages um, because of the, the chalk network is actually very widely, the chalk stream is very widely spread, spread out from the south and the west central part of the district and they're all affected. Um, uh, and um, yes, they will recover. There, there's scope for recovery, so there's, there's some grounds for optimism. But they will only recover um, with the right approach. And um, they reached a point, actually, when if they drown completely, they won't recover. So we're in that sort of critical stage at the moment. Um, and I, I, in terms of development, my understanding of the local plan is, to some extent, it is conditional. If you read what the officers have said, they've said very clearly uh, that all these numbers, all these proposals, all these suggested, and at the moment, nothing's been adopted. It's all a question of debate and consultation. Is dependent upon the water issue actually being resolved. If it is not resolved, uh, then we'll have to actually have another debate on this subject. So there's a lot of conditionality here. Um, and, uh, but at least this is actually focusing attention uh, on, 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 a, on a, one of the salient issues. One of the other things is, has been touched on is that's a question of abstraction. A lot of the abstraction licenses, I think we need to review the whole thing. Many of them, especially of agriculture, I know a not, lot, lot of the local farmers, the original abstraction licenses were, and many were unlimited and irrevocable. The modern ones are not. But I think we need to look at this whole question of the abstraction licenses, who's getting them, whether they can be reviewed, uh, and exactly what impact they, what they have. Um, because we need to take that all into account. So this is a very broadly phased issue, in fact. Um, and in addition to that, we need to look at the chalk accuracies. Now, many of them have not been properly mapped, actually. We don't really understand fully how they work, how they relate to one another, and precisely um, what impact and how they were finished. So it's a whole, there's, a, there's a lot of issues, but at least this is a significant way forward. So I'm happy to... Uh, to, uh, to Councillor Cathcart. Uh, Councillor Sue Ellington. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, well, I've heard more this afternoon that go for, not me, Gov, it's one of them other agencies what have got to do it, or it's got to be the government, than I've ever heard in my life before. The fact remains that we start, this administration starts the process of suggesting that we need all these houses and then blames everybody else for not falling into line and providing the equipment or the resources with which to make it happen. And 1.4 billion litres. I'm far more worried about when you've got it, what you're going to do with it, because it will all have to be processed at Utton's Drove, mostly, sewage works, and then find its way into the river, which will have to be pumped into the river, because Utton's Drove is considerably lower than the river. And my village is in the middle of that. So I am very concerned about the number of houses that are being suggested for the new plan. And I'm even more concerned about where the water will go. Thank you, Councillor Arrington. Councillor Toomey, Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Could you pause a moment? Could Nick, Councillor Nick Wright wanted to come back. I'll carry on. That's, that's very kind of you, Chairman, and I really appreciate that. I, I was just wanting to make the point. It, it is strange because in the winter we spend the winter months worrying about flooding and the summer months about having lack of water. So it is, this is a very seasonal motion, which uh, I, I, I'm sure we can all see, but it does have its uh, point. And, you know, Councillor Cathcart is please. right. Do please keep your point short, because you're coming back a second time. That's very kind. Uh, Councillor Cathcart is right to say the farmers do have abstraction rights. That is severely restricted. And uh, just to get my own back on Councillor Cathcart, I should like to say that the breweries should have the same restrictions. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Wright. So, um, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, would you like to respond? or have your comment. Sorry, your comment. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, it was enlightening to hear what um, Councillor Roberts had to say about the longevity of this issue with water and the chalk streams, and it's not a new problem. Um, and I hear Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Yes, you know, the letter can come to me, but I don't have the power. You should know that, because you've been in this position before. And in fact, Chair, I would like to ask him what he did when he was in position to help with the uh, water issue. I'd love to hear his answer. Um, and as Please for don't the interrupt, Councillor Dr. Tony Hawkins. Thank you. I seem to always attract um, <laughs> interruptions. Um, and as for the emphasis on housing numbers, I kind of knew that's where you were going to go. Um, but then again, Councillor Wright, you were here, as was Councillor Roberts, when the current hydrochemical plan was uh, created. You know what the numbers are, and you know how this process works. What's happened is we're rolling what was put in that plan into the new local plan. The numbers are there, you know. So. You are virtue you signaling, if I can return that back to you, through you, Chair, to Councillor Roberts. Um, so the issue here is we, don't, we are not the Water Authority. What we're asking is that the Water Authority actually does something to resolve this problem. It's not a planning problem. There are other uses, other users of water. You've already rightly pointed out. You've got the breweries, you've got the agriculture, you've got the leisure, you've got businesses, you've got commercial buildings. There's a lot of users of water. So to try and make out that it's only house building that's causing the problem, I think, come on, let's be real here. 
um, you ought to, and we are trying to actually explain to residents how things work. The fact that this is, you've heard a lot more here now than you ever did before, I'm afraid, is because you didn't explain to them how it works when you were in a position to do so. So um, I think what I will say is this. We are looking at ways of, obviously, um, making sure that we don't, um, you know, we, we take into account what the issue is, how it can be resolved, work with partners who can um, provide the resource and the infrastructure we need. And this is, that's what this is doing. And I know there was a question earlier on about what we want from the Oxcam Act. And one of the things that we are asking the government to do as part of the Oxcam Act project is to actually resolve this water issue because they will not be able to actually uh, implement their proposal or their proposed plans um, in this area if that is not resolved. So we're tying that into it. And I just want to say lastly, please, come on, let's be real here, folks. Let's stop misinforming our residents. We're not doing the them good. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have no other request to speak, so I am going to say something before we come to our seconder. Uh, and that is that I'm aware that um, people have been concerned about the water sufficiency in the Cam Valley for many years, long before um, uh, our local MP uh, got hold of it. Uh, and the point is, in my view, it is the government that is setting the housing numbers that we are required to comply with. And that is why it is appropriate to be writing to the government um, in the letter the government gave a requirement to us to deliver housing. And it is they who need to know that if that housing is uh, deliverable or not on the basis of the water supply. And that is why the local plan is determined as is written as it is. So um, in my view, it is appropriate that the leader and chief executive write to the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and the Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government highlighting the issues rather than anybody else. Thank you. Councillor Pippa Halings. Thank you, Chair, and through you. And um, obviously, I'm in support of this motion being presented by Councillor Dr. Ian Solom. I thank Councillor Nick Wright for tagging me <laughs> in this as the Chair of the Climate Change and Environment Committee. And I would like to say yes. So before. Um, this became something um, that is promoted by our local MP. In July 19, virtue signaling from the very beginning, we declared a climate and ecological emergency. 90% of local councils have declared a climate emergency. 12% of local councils have declared an ecological emergency. And we are very proud to be one of the first to do that. But we didn't just declare it, we said, what will we do with it? In February 21, we adopted our doubling nature strategy. What does it say in our doubling nature strategy? There is a section on water. There is a section on chalk streams. We were already identifying the threats and saying in our new local plan, because this one doesn't do enough, in our new local plan, all of our strategies were saying, we oblige offices in our new local plan. We're shaping it to say, make sure you address these issues. So the evidence commissioned was this integrated water management strategy. Seasonal, no councillor Nick Wright, because it's integrated. It deals with drought, it deals with flooding, it deals with what comes in, what goes out, because it's an integrated water management study. So this isn't seasonal. Um, and it's groundbreaking because very few councils have done this kind of study for their local plans. This is the first that is using the results of this to say it will be a constraint to meeting housing need. Now, what the motion says is what we have to do to resolve it because there are many reasons for over abstraction as Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins has said. But what I want to focus on are some of these questions about and what are we doing? So we're pointing fingers at government, what are we doing? I just would love it if everybody would read the most amazing document, which is the preferred options that has gone out for consultation. Again, this is groundbreaking. I do think it's groundbreaking because what it's saying is, it's asking a question. 
It's saying, will you support a green infrastructure standard on developers, which is not only about stringent water efficiency use down to 80 litres, but it is also saying that developers have to ensure that they revitalise the chalk streams and they're part of the revitalisation of the chalk stream network and that they have to prove that they are not damaging that. It creates and asks everybody in the community to answer Shall we have a river corridor policy in the local plan? Never before. CAM and its tributaries, a river corridor policy that developers Council have Hayes, to respect. Would you like Thank to you draw much. your points to a close? So I would just say, not only support this motion, but also look at that consultation because the local plan is going into things it's never gone before because we do do what we talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, back to you, Councillor Solemn, as the proposer of the motion. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for some really excellent contributions. Um, and I'd particularly like to thank uh, Nigel for highlighting the, the conditional nature of the numbers in the local plan, I mean, or in proposals for the local plan, I should say. There seems to be a lot of anger uh, in the chamber about the, the proposed numbers, but it is quite clear in that proposal that we we would uh, pull back or, or stagger the building out of those proposals if this water issue isn't deal, dealt with. So if that's what the opposition benches want to see, then maybe they shouldn't support this this motion, which wants to deal with the crisis we face now faster because it's it's not about the numbers that are being built out in the future it's about what's happening right now now councillor chamberlain knows where i grew up it's not actually very far from where the pipeline crosses from the eland valley dams through on its way through to birmingham that was an investment that the Victorians made to solve a public health crisis in Birmingham. We need supply infrastructure along with all the water catchment management and, and the great things that Councillor Haylings has talked about in our, in our proposals and referenced uh, to uh, what, what water companies can do and what developers can do to help improve chalk, chalk streams. But we do need that supply infrastructure to s solve the environmental crisis, the ecological crisis that our chalk streams are facing in South Cambridgeshire. So I do urge everyone to back the motion, and I do hope that everyone does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's go to a vote then, members, as there's no other call. So, uh, if people would like to um, support the recommend the motion, 16A, in the name of Dr. Ian Solomon, please press the blue button to say you're there, then press green. If you wish to vote against, press red, and if you wish to abstain, press yellow. Has everybody voted? Yep, I voted. I voted this time. Okay, so I th we've got 27 people voted. One person's a question mark. No, there are 28 people in the room, I believe. Yeah, but that's in oh, sorry, included no, in the 27. Right. Yep, okay. But that's included in the 27. So only 27 out of the 28 people in the room have um, uh, pressed the blue button. Look, I mean, vote this through if you want to, right? But just don't build so many houses that I'm not yeah. voting in this. So, so can you add, are you either against or... Uh, not sorry. voting, Chair. Choosing not to vote. Councillor Dr Richard Williams, would, would you like it to be noted that you are choosing not to vote? You can minute it if you wish, Chair. Thank you very much. I mean, so otherwise that motion is carried. Thank you. What's the point of the motion? Thank you very much. So that motion's carried. So we'll move on to Cantor's Cant Mount. 
Item 16B on the agenda, standing in the name of Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Would you like to speak? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Van der Weyer, for your constructive contribution. Um, let's hope that we get a bit more constructive comments later. Okay, so um, last time in this council, we passed a motion, um, and that motion said very boldly that this council believes planning works best when local communities are empowered uh, to shape their local areas. Now, I voted for that because I happen to believe it's true, uh, and I think every other uh, member of the council uh, voted for it um, as well. Now, I think we all know that that motion was directed at the government. It was about the planning reforms. Um, but, you know, we're not powerless here in this council. If we really believe that planning works best when local communities are empowered to shape their local areas, we can do something about it. And one thing we can do is agree my motion and we can empower our parish councils um, to have the ability uh, to more directly shape planning in their local areas. Because parish councils are our communities. Parish councils are close to our communities. Parish councils are embedded in our local communities. Any member uh, of the community in our area, because I think we're entirely parished, can turn up to their parish council on a Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, whenever, in their village, and they can make their view known on a planning application. And if they can persuade their parish council that a planning application ought to be determined by democratically elected councillors in public, and the parish council agrees, then I think the parish council should have the right to require that uh, planning application to be considered in public by elected councillors. Similarly, if a parish council uh, wishes to require the planning uh, committee to consider an application when it disagrees with the officer's recommendations, again, they should have the power to do so. We are fortunate in South Cambridgeshire that we live in a parished area, as I have said. And the parish system, in my view, is an amazing system because it brings local government right down to the lowest level, right into the heart of communities, and at a very, very uh, accessible level. So if we really mean it, that we believe planning works best when local communities are empowered, let's do what we can to empower those local communities because there is no better way to do that than to give parish councils the power they need. Now, we have discussed this issue before. Um, we were told, I think, that the current scheme of delegation was temporary. I think that was back in May 2020. Uh, we were told there would be a review, but here we are 18 months later, and there is no change. We still have a system where no democratically elected councillor ultimately has the power to decide whether a planning application goes to committee or not. And I think that is wrong. And as I say, if we believe in empowering local communities, if it wasn't just a PR stunt as part of a Lib Dem plan to show up the government, which I'm sure it wasn't, I wouldn't believe that with my colleagues, if we really mean it, then we should support this motion. And I will say one final thing, because I think I may have had a foretaste of some of the arguments that are going to be made against this because there was some hilarity uh, in the break earlier about 24-hour um, council uh, planning committee meetings. If that's your argument, have the courage to go to your parish councils and say, we don't trust you. We don't think you're sensible enough. We think you'll make silly decisions. Okay? Because if that's really the argument, that there'll be too much work and parish councils can't be trusted, go and tell them that you don't trust them. So I very much hope that that's not the case, and I very much hope the Council will support this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Do you have a seconder? Yes. Councillor Heather Williams. Do you wish to speak now, or do you wish to reserve your right? I think I can speak now, please, Chair. Thank you. Do go ahead. Thank you. Um, so when this, this first come in, and I think... There are a few of us um, that sat on that day in this chamber at planning committee where we had a report given to us literally 
almost as we were coming in. And it was a really, really difficult day for many of us, regardless of political lines. Planning is a, is a statutory function of council on that planning committee. But it was very, very difficult. Um, and it was suggested at the time that we would, we would, it was a narrow vote, five votes to four with one abstention, I believe, um, from the top of my head. And uh, it was, so it was very close. And we were reassured that this would be reviewed and that parish councils would be consulted with, every parish council would be consulted. So then that came to full council um, in May 2020. Um, and yet we sit here now in September 2021, we have a scheme of delegation which we have never consulted on with parish councils or members of the public. It, do you know what? You may be right. Parish councils may say, no, we don't want to have this ability. No, we, you know, we can't be trusted, although I do think they can be. Um, but have the confidence of your convictions to actually take it to them and consult. But we've had, we've had nothing. We've done something, fundamental change. And I mean, when we took that planning um, committee decision, actually a letter had gone out the previous day, I think, saying that the chairman would have a veto. And then in the meeting, so all the parish council got told we're gonna have a veto. Then in the meeting, we got told, no, we can't have a veto. So they'd all been misinformed before then, not intentionally, I must stress there, but was a consequence of the situation we found ourselves in. Um, but there is no excuse now you, to, to carry on doing this, having not consulted at all. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing as to why people would think that's acceptable. Um, so I believe that this should be brought in now and if you want to go back to parish councils not being allowed, then take it to them, put it to them. At least try, at least try all this and give a bit of trust back because you know, we've got a report saying there's a lack of trust. It's no wonder, really. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. We do have to stand up for the things that we've said. And as has just been said by Councillor Heather Williams, we did indicate in writing to the parish councils that we would be actually checking out what they felt about this. We would be um, going to them, having a proper consultation. Um, there is really now no excuse that we don't do that. And we, if anybody's gonna have trust in this council, it won't be by saying no to this. If you don't trust them, tell them so, as has already been said. But we're not asking that it be everybody, you know, everybody whose house is on the applications that. We are being very specific. We are wanting it to be a right of the elected body for the villages. They are elected in exactly the same way as we are. They are chosen in exactly the same manner as we are by the people for what we and they can do for them. And we cannot simply put words across about, oh, when local com communities are empowered. You know, unless you actually stand that up, it's just more virtue signaling. It's just playing a record that you just think will keep working on people. Um, and it's now time that we as a council actually stood up and um, gave the parish councils an opportunity. And as has been said, some will say yes and some will maybe say no. But certainly the, the ones that I serve have many a time in the last 18 months um, been um, really quite an, uh, angered by the fact that their local knowledge, their local interests, their local residents um, are not getting the opportunity of having their cases heard by elected representatives. That instead it is being done um, basically in closed sessions 
uh, by people who are not elected and therefore, you know, quite rightly, they aren't answerable. But we are all answerable. And so, come on, let's um, get grasp the nettle here and do that uh, consultation now and find out what our parish councils say. I'm not saying that we, we say uh, yes or no to this now. What I'm saying is that we, we go ahead with that promise that was made in writing to them. It was in writing. They were told that we realised that there were problems and concerns of trust and that a consultation Councilor exercise... Roberts, would you like to wind up, please? Thank you, Chairman. Would be done. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cathcart. Has come up before. I'm never. Con I'm not convinced, frankly, that um, uh, a as has been pointed out, parish council gets what it wants. But also, to be under pressure from developers. I'm approached from time to time by developers who say, "Look, can you use your influence to have this brought to committee?" And I know that parish councils have the same um, uh, the same pressure brought on them because many developers think they have a better chance through committee. And by the officers. So I'm not sure you're convinced you're doing the parish councils any favours. You've got to be very careful here. Uh, in addition to this, the motion makes no mention about um, planning reasons. Uh, if you want something to be brought before a planning committee, you should actually have planning reasons. The idea of unimpeded uh, access, I find that a little bit of a problem. Uh, I'm also concerned that at the moment the planning committee seems to have its resources about right, i.e. it concentrates on major items because of important ones. If you're not very careful, you'll find planning committee will be clogged up with numerous applications, which has happened in the past, 30 or 40 applications that are sitting perhaps, often very small applications for one reason or another. There are resource implications about getting that written up, there are resource applications about getting it heard. It could be a delay because of that. So there are lots of implications here. Um, and I think the idea that parish council's requests should automatically go to committee, uh, I think actually you have to be quite careful there. So I have great reluctance in supporting this particular motion unless it can be clearly demonstrated to be everyone's interest, parish councils and residents. And I think that evidence is rather thin on the ground at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Point, point of information, please, Chairman. Carry on. Um, my recall as a member of the planning committee is that it actually states very clearly um, on the applications when they go to the parishes that they are required to put in uh, material reasons for it being requested. It's not um, a willy-nilly everything. It actually clearly states that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Deborah Roberts has clarified the incorrect information that she felt was before the council. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, so next speaker is Councillor Brian Mills. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Councillor Cathcart has um, expressed many of the reservations that I've Councillor got. Councillor Brian Mills, could you just put your microphone a little bit closer, please? Oh, as close as you like, Chair. So what I was saying that the Council of Cathcart has already expressed uh, many of the reservations that I have. I'm a firm believer in subsidiarity of taking decisions at the lowest possible level. But as a member of the Parish Council in Sawston uh, and as an uh, attendee and member of the Planning Committee this week, um, I'm very familiar with the Parish Council's process of evaluating planning applications. You just mentioned material considerations. Many of the issues that we have uh, raised in planning matters are not material considerations at all. And I remember uh, being on the planning committee when a planning application for an extension of a four foot to a, a fence was brought to the planning committee. And I fear that such trivial issues will come along and clog our planning system that is already stretched. And I can't support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Sue Ellington. 
excuse me, can I just oh, ask you, can I, before you start, Councillor Sue Ellington, could I just request that members do other members the courtesy of not muttering while they are about to do their own, members are about to speak, thank you. Councillor Sue Ellington, do go ahead. Thank you. I have to say that one of the reasons uh, that my parish clerk came to make her uh, request this, uh, this afternoon uh, to ask a question um, was because there is extreme frustration within the parish council that the, uh, they do debate um, at planning applications. They do identify material issues. They do submit those within the time frame, which can be quite short and quite difficult at times. Not that it makes any difference to getting a result, but never mind, that's not the point. Um, and they were so frustrated, they asked her to come and try and G up the planning committee. And I think, again, as uh, Council Williams said, we are undervaluing our parish council. We are saying, oh, you don't really understand the issues. Well, if they send in an, a, com, uh, a concern that is non-material, we write back to them and say, it's non-material. Sorry, mate, you're going to get the, the officers make the decision. If it's a material consideration, then we ought to be considering it out of respect for our parish councils. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. I um, actually want to thank Councillor Dr. Richard Williams for uh, bringing this motion um, because actually it does give us another opportunity uh, to clarify issues with how we um, how we engage with parish councils and the importance we put on their input into the uh, planning process. Um, but I want to start from what is the lawful position for how PCs actually are by law um, enabled to participate. And it is found in section 25 of the Town and Country Planning Development Management Procedure of Order of 2015. And what that says effectively is that we as planning authority, we notify parish councils of applications in their area, and they can then make representation as statutory consultees. Um, but they cannot, obviously, uh, unduly influence planning committee agenda or the application. They don't determine it either. But their input is important, and we cannot determine it without hearing from them. Um, so in some ways, you know, the, the requirement or the, the, the task of giving them unimpeded power uh, suggests that they will have an influence on the agenda and determine the agenda effectively, which is wrong. It does also mean that we will potentially be operating unlawfully, and we don't want to do that. And I must remind us all that it was in 2016 that the previous Conservative administration actually took away the automatic referral issue and uh, introduced you know, uh, the, the, refer the referral by setting out material reasons uh, for doing so. But obviously that process didn't work well because when we then in, in inherited, the, um, you know, came into power, we actually then looked at the um, issue and we did revise um, the way in which it works. And as far as I know, uh, parish councils are able to refer applications with uh, reasons and it gets looked at in a proper way and they get told if it goes or if it doesn't, and if it doesn't, why not? So we engage with them. The other thing we've done is actually we have area teams, we split into area teams, and we actually have quarterly meetings with parishes and planning area teams. Right? And the whole point of this is so that they can engage with the, for example, you know, with the, with the um, officers who deal with the applications, and they've got a relationship that they can have if they want to with the area team leaders. That is fundamental to providing them with you know, assistance, with help, you know, if they have any issues, they go to the team leader and they, solve, you know, they try and resolve it there. But what that means is they can put in better um, you know, requests that come through will be perhaps something they can't resolve at that level. Um, I mean, we had one meeting two days ago 
We're expecting 14 parishes. Four turned up. Okay. So, so we'd you. like to work with them if they want to work with us. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Tina Hawkins. Councillor Nick Wright. Thank you. And uh, just to reflect on Councillor Hawkins' last point, that just shows how this administration has lost the confidence of the parish councils with, you know, making those sort of comments is, you know, it just shows where you are with this. It, it, is, it is, over the years that I've been a councillor, we have seen less and less and less going to planning committee. Uh, admittedly, when, when I started in 2004, 80% of decisions were determined by officers. All the rest went to planning committee. Now we're at about 99 point something percent of decisions being determined by planning officers. Now they're, you know, in spite of what Councillor Mills has said, they're, they're no better than councillors doing it because so many of the interpretations of planning policy are subjective, you know, and it's down to what, what you see as a person, as a parish councillor or as a councillor. And there's, you know, there's plenty of times I've sat in here at planning committee and listened to councillors talking about non-material uh, objections uh, among, among everything else. So let's not lose faith in the people who put an immense amount of work for no, no, no other reason than they want to be part of supporting their communities and shaping the future of their communities. Let's not rubbish that. Let's give them all the support we can. You know, that is part of, part of, you know, supporting our communities is so important. Uh, and I would really ask people to support this motion, to show some support for our parish councils and the very impressive work they do. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Ruth Betson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to address my comments to your deputy because I can't see you. <laughs> um, contrary to um, other smaller parishes in South Cambridgeshire, Camborne, my ward, is a town. The town uh, council has 19 councillors. It is quite large compared to other parishes. We have a planning committee that uh, meets on a regular basis. Um, we have a wealth of experience um, within the committee, within the town council, mainly because of the uh, amount of development in Camborne. As you know, Camborne is a new town and it continues to develop. Um, but as I think I mentioned in the previous um, council meeting, the town council has been sidelined. Um, it has been disregarded and not involved. And I'm very concerned about this um, because Campbell needs to be a, a unit, a cohesive town, not separate uh, pieces. And I, I'm, I'm very sorry that the um, Councillor Bridget Smith, the leader of this administration has left because I, I, I did mention this before that the um, chairman of uh, Camborne Town Council uh, feels so strongly on this matter that he wrote a letter to her. Um, so I would urge everybody to vote for this motion. We cannot um, have people deciding on the future of our communities and our wards in isolation without consulting the people who have to live there on a day-to-day -day basis. The, our communities, our town councils, our parish councils, they need to be involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Betson. Um, I'm mindful of the time. Just Thank you. So could we just make our contributions brief? Uh, Councillor Pippa Halings, followed by Councillor John Batchelor and Councillor Grenville Chamberlain. And we've got five minutes left, so I'll give you like one minute each, please. 
Thank you very much. Councillor Richard Williams referenced my motion at last council, and it was unanimously adopted, and yes, it was directed against the planning reforms, which do threaten to strip away any local voice um, by local authorities or local communities on individual applications. But it wasn't just a Lib Dem response. That was, I am now the lead voice on the LGA, and that was a cross-party response to government um, in its consultation on those planning reforms. Now, anybody would know me as chair of the planning committee that I am seriously committed to. I also have a very large ward. We have a planning committee. I assist regularly. I am in constant contact with them. They do an amazing job. They do a fantastic job. And whenever we do, we make sure that what, you know, we, as all of you, have the ability to ask the scheme of delegation to call in an application, and, and we use that, not unimpeded, but according to the material planning reasons. And that's the scheme of delegation. But we did have a planning review, and we know that the results of that planning review said that the scheme of delegation, as is at the moment, it's Dr. okay, Hayes. but it, Dr. Just me, sorry. it does say that we need to keep it under review. And the planning committee development group at the moment, you've just had an email from the um, officer in charge. What we've asked is before we go to parish councils, that we do a comparative study of all councils around the country and what they do with schemes of delegation. And what they do in terms of planning performance as well, which is another question on the agenda today. So how you balance that. Bring that to our planning committee development group and then we structure the consultation with communities that we have promised Councilor we are Hailings. up to a year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Councillor John Batchelor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just to have a bit of reality in this uh, debate, well, we had a peer review last year that had a very extensive consultation with parish councils. Uh, that has now developed you know, the planning development group. But uh, at this time, I was chair of the planning committee and we immediately took up the peer review's initial um, recommendations for the delegations. We've changed uh, the matter so that any uh, item which is requested to go to committee and is delegated, there's a full report that goes directly to the parish council to explain why the, uh, uh, the request um, has not been met. That report is a public document and is on the website for anyone to see. Uh, there's another protocol in the, where uh, the officer may, may um, conclude that he, he actually agrees largely with the parish council's position that the does consult with the parish council to see if they are prepared um, to withdraw their request for it to go to the committee. So there is a consultation again. Councilor and Hatcher, just in passing, just in passing, um, my experience of the delegation numbers is that we uh, deal with something of the order of 200 requests per year uh, to go to it and put that in context. Uh, Councillor Batchelor, I'm going to have to ask you. The planning committee deals with less than 50 currently. Thank you. Councillor Grenville Chamberlain. Thank you, Chair. I will be brief. <laughs> Good. We've listened and we've heard uh, just how much this council appreciates the input from its parish and town councillors. We are told repeatedly that this is a listening council. So all I say, gentlemen and ladies, is please listen to the people upon whom we trust. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for being admirably succinct. Right, on that case, we, um, and the seconder has already spoken, so I'm going to go, sorry. Yep. I'm going to go back to um, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, who proposed the motion. Thank you very much, Chair. I will also um, endeavour to be brief. Thank all members for their um, contributions um, to this debate. Just a few points. Um, the uh, motion we passed says we want to empower local communities. We have heard contributions about engaging with local communities, but that is not what we said we believed in last time. We said we believed in empowering them. Empowering means giving them some power. Um, and as I've said, I don't think of a better way of doing that. 
um, of them, them giving powers on parish councils. Unimpeded, if that helps um, some members, I meant unimpeded in the sense of uh, not being mediated by an officer, not, ha not having an officer having the right to veto a parish council uh, request. So that was what that word was intended to mean, nothing more, um, nothing less. Um, I would take concerns um, about, you know, the, the word unimpeded a bit more seriously if the council hadn't voted against previous motions on this topic, which are much more limited. So I rather suspect that even if we had a more limited motion like we did a few months ago, you would vote against it or the council would vote against it. So I, you know, I, I would take that more seriously if we'd voted in favor of previous motions, which were more, more limited. Um, finally, on the point of the legal power, of course, we're talking about the scheme of delegation here. So we're not talking about, um, you know, going against the, you know, the, whatever legal provisions are cited. And um, we're talking about the scheme of delegation, and you can't have it both ways. You can't say the dastardly Tories took away the power, but, you know, it would be illegal to have Sorry, the power. Sorry, Dr. Richard. It's yes. about the scheme of delegation and changing the scheme of delegation so that we have automatic calling. And I will end there. Thank you Thank very you. much, Chair. And can I point out to members that it doesn't make it any easier for anybody to hear if you still say the same number of the words but quicker. It's easier to say fewer words. I'm happy to say it again Thank much you. more slowly. So, yeah. um, much more with slowly. With that time limit that we have, I would like to go to the vote on this motion. So, uh, if you wish to support Councillor Dr. Richard Williams' this motion, uh, please press the blue button to register your presence and uh, vote uh, green. If you wish to oppose, press red. And if you wish to abstain, press yellow. Has everybody voted? We have lost one member, certainly, because Councillor Richard, uh, Councillor Bridget Smith has left. Right. Councillor Wright, are you having difficulty? Yeah, voting? I don't think it recorded my vote. I didn't see the number move when I voted. I think there's just one person whose vote we are missing, members. Could you just be quiet for a moment so that we can work out whose vote has not registered? So, members, thank you for your patience on that. Uh, the vote uh, is nine in favour, 18 against, and so that motion falls. Thank you. So, 18, uh, sorry, 16C, standing in the name of Councillor Jeff Harvey. <coughs> Councillor Harvey, could we have some quiet, please? Thank you. Councillor yes. Harvey, would um, you like to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, this motion is about heritage, and, and it's about conservation, but um, conservation in its, its widest sense. In relation to that, in planning law, um, the laws we have at the moment, in part, re really a response to the excesses of the post-war period, I suppose. And, you know, thankfully, we now recognize that conserving our heritage assets and their settings is very important. But climate change means that everything is now connected to everything else in its cause and its effect. And weighing the balance is very important. And it must be done in a very rapidly evolving context. I don't think this is an exact quote, but I think I heard Mary Beard say that history is something that continually rewrites itself. And I think we've always, we've all um, perhaps of a Sunday visited a, a national trust or English heritage site and, and noticed the odd few bricked up windows um, in a beautiful uh, red brick facade. And we know that that was because of the window tax. And far from having erased history, I think it's something that actually connects us to the past by enriching the story. And how curious it would be 
to return here in 200 years' time and to find no imprint on our historic fabric of what is our greatest existential crisis. But equally alarming, if we had erased everything that had come before us. So it's really a question of um, skillfully weighing a balance. Now this council notes that planning law establishes the principle that uh, harm to a heritage asset should be weighed against and, and therefore to some extent balanced by a public benefit. And that though the weighing of the balance is the subject of a statutory guidance, the assessment of public benefit cannot be blind to climate change, nor to the context of the Council's declaration of a climate emergency and its adaption of a zero carbon strategy. And so it's for this reason that, summarizing uh, the substantive part, officer reports will show how the balance has been made between public benefit, including where that benefit comes from considering the climate and the preservation of the historic fabric. And secondly, where appropriate, officers will seek the advice of the council's sustainability officer to add to the um, views of the conservation officers to contribute to the um, assessment exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Um, I am going to take the step now to just vote um, that we continue. We haven't quite reached the time, but just to enable the subsequent debate to go more easily. Can I just take a vote that we continue members? Uh, I propose that we continue. Does everybody accept that by affirmation? Any against? Any ob uh, objections? No, okay, thank you very much. So that's that 18.05 we voted to continue. Thank you, sorry. So we have questions, uh, members who would like to contribute to the debate. Dr. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton. Oh, sorry, we need a seconder. <laughs> sorry. Uh, which is uh, Councillor Dr. Cooper Haley, is that you? Yeah. Sorry, I've given you a doctorate. I think um, I shouldn't have done. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> do you wish to speak now or do you wish to reserve your right? Um, I'll just speak very briefly now, I think, to, to the matter, which is we've, we've just been talking about planning committees and, you know, as parish councils know, as communities know, as we know, as committee members, it's all about the balance. And the balance that we're looking at with this motion is our cultural assets, you know, and the conservation of them, and how we can adapt to climate change, how we can reduce fuel bills and how we can keep people warm in very old, drafty buildings. And, and this balance is, um, you know, what, what we need to do. And all that this motion is doing is saying, can we provide more information about that balance? Because at the moment, it's the technical consultee that basically it's the conservation, and we're not all experts in conservation of historic buildings, so that's sort of the strongest weight. But all we're saying is, let's now bring into the balance the fact that they, as everybody else, want to contribute, want to make their houses warmer, drier, and reduce the, the level of emissions. So let's just bring that into the balance so that when we come to either officer delegated decisions or when we come to the planning committee, it's there and explicit. And we're not predetermining any decision, we're just throwing that into that balance given the fact that we are, you know, where we are in terms of climate change. So please support this um, supremely articulated motion by my vice chair. Thank you, Councillor Hayling. So the next speaker is Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton. Thank you, Jen. Um, historic buildings have always changed with new energy sources and the environment. Medieval timber frame buildings had brick fireplaces and chimneys installed in later centuries to allow them to burn coal. Now we need to... <laughs> Thank you for the noises off, Councillor Roberts. Um, now we need to think about replacing fossil fuel. History is about change and adaptation, not status. England has the oldest housing stock in Europe. 
And if buildings are not allowed to adapt in an appropriate way for the use of new energy sources and to deal with overheating, they will be less valued and hence not maintained and conserved. Reducing carbon from historic buildings is a major contribution to meeting targets. New Evidence for Heritage Counts, a research publication by Historic England on behalf of the Historic Environment Forum, shows that we can reduce the carbon emissions of historic buildings by over 60% by 2050 through refurbishment and refit. Research also shows that the sooner the actions are taken, the more effectively we can address carbon in buildings. It is possible to undertake interventions successfully without compromising historic buildings. Reports and practice indicate that, historic, that the historic England approach is constructive conservation. The recent Grosvenor report gives, gives examples of this, including one close to home. Grade one listed buildings in Trinity College were granted permission for a major refit which included the installation of a ground source heat pump and double glazing. This is a good example of constructive conservation. Thank you, Councillor Dawson. Uh, Councillor Peter Payne. Thank you, Chair. Um, I very much support this motion. Uh, I think Councillor Jeff Harvey has set out very clearly why we need to address this as a matter of some urgency. Uh, indeed, we need to consider also the report of the Independent Commission in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, which is due to give a final report shortly. This is one of the key, four key themes, is the emissions from buildings. And we cannot address that without also addressing listed buildings and others. Um, as English Heritage say, in their guidance, and they, after all, deal with the most sensitive of the listed buildings, the grade one, improving the efficiency of your home, whether it's listed in a conservation area or indeed built before 1919, can be done sympathetically and without compromising its historic character. Um, this is, as the motion states, a matter of balance, balance between conservation and the reduction of carbon emissions. But I think in the light of the climate emergency that we all agree to and the developing policy picture, we have to accept that energy has to be part of that conservation. We're not just conserving the history and fabric of the buildings. I'm conscious of a report by the Grantham Foundation on climate change, now four years ago, which assessed the impact of the restrictions on historic buildings on the costs of heating them. Their assessment is that it cost the owners of those buildings 500 million because of the restrictions on the energy efficiency measures that they were not able to take. Um, and of course, those costs in the four years since that report was issued have risen already and will be radically rising shortly. So it is not just a matter of conservation, there are other urgent reasons. I mentioned that report, but I, I also have to say that that report, like the Historic England report, refers to both listed buildings and buildings in conservation areas. And of course, we have 80 conservation areas in this district, a much larger number of houses affected many of which can be improved without the same sensitivity that applies to listed buildings. And whilst it is not a matter for this motion, and perhaps to be taken another day, we do have to come back to what we do for conservation buildings. So, to sum up, I think that this is an increasingly high priority. We all know that climate change is going to be very much discussed over the next few months, and we have to take the lead on this. We have to not wait until we see developments and then consider how we follow them up. We have to do what some other councils have done. Thank you. We have to do what some other councils have done, produce our own guidance, take our own measures, and that is what this motion proposes. Thank you, Councillor Fain. On to Councillor Cathcart. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've got a lot of sympathy for the 
for this motion, and I, it's been thoughtfully crafted because it does seem to strike this sort of balance. I, I'm in a bit of a dilemma, I have to say, um, uh, because I've always sort of felt that we, this district is particularly rich in, uh, in buildings of quality, of variety. The villages are studded with small developments and old buildings that actually add charm and character to the built landscape. Um, uh, and at the same time, I, I fully support the, the, the climate change policies of the council. Um, and in many cases, the, there isn't a problem in a sense because you can have it both ways. You can actually carry out adaptations which respect the fabric. But I've seen cases where it doesn't respect the fabric. So I, I am a, I, I'm in a dilemma about actually which way, which way to go. I, 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 I respect the balance crafted in this, and I think it's, it, it could be a way forward, but I'm not, I'm not sure, because seeing examples of, as I have of um, uh, adaptations, ostensibly for climate change purposes, which actually do irrevocably damage the fabric, um, it, it, it's a difficult one to judge, but I, I respect the motives behind it, and I think there is a way forward charter there, in fact, you know. So anyway, that's all I want to say at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cathcart. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, th I thought I ought to start off by saying about how you know, planning is a statutory function of the council, Chair. So to be clear, we all politics should be put aside on deciding something like this. So I'm taking it in the same merit as I would if I was sitting on planning committee. Um, and I would hope that officers are, and I do have confidence that they are already taking into consideration other things and creating that balance, perhaps not noting it in the reports as, as we would wish, um, but hope, I would hope that they are already doing this. Um, and I will, will support this, this um, motion. I mean, I, I would agree with the remarks that Councillor Daunton made. Um, so I... My degree was in law and history, and one of the first things I did was um, a review through the architecture of Wimpole Hall, um, which I'm sure Councillor Van der Veer is fully um, aware of. But that in itself has adapted over time, you know, bringing electricity in to, to these buildings, phones, everything else, it, it evolves. Um, we do need to preserve their character and of the area, but there can be evolution within that. So I think it is a balance. And I, I think that's important that we also make clear that officers still, nothing we're doing here impedes the, the officers' impartiality in making that balance or committee members, because I think it is difficult when we're talking about these planning issues to make sure that we're clear the statutory functions and not the political. But, um, but I will, will be supporting it, and um, I have confidence that officers are already doing this, actually. They're very conscientious. To, um, and uh, perhaps they can word it slightly more going forward for, for what members want to see. Um, and uh, maybe we'll see some applications that we can uh, committing, or perhaps there might be a supplementary planning document at some point to, to deal with historical buildings or something tangible that we can help to guide officers more. Thank you, Councillor Williams. So, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, thank you, and through you, Chairman. Um, I do appreciate and respect um, Councillor Harvey's um, views on this. I, I, I know it's heartfelt, um, and I know that he's done his, his homework on it. Um, however, I have to say that um, I'm very pleased that I still burn coal, and we still burn wood. Um, we have central heating, but in our house, uh, in the evenings, we only have uh, we only use the wood and coal fire. We turn the central heating off. Uh, we don't run it as a hot house all the time. However, whether you're living in a, a modern home or a, an old traditional uh, historical home, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that thanks to the zealots of the uh, eco-warriors, uh, it's only a question of time before we're all plunged into the dark and into the cold. And even Greta Thunberg will have to get a winter warming woolies underneath her out um, if she's going to keep warm. Because what we've got at the moment is never going to um, get us through bad winters. It's just not ready. It's not there. Um, it's, it's costing us a fortune and will cost a fortune. 
And it's okay for middle class people, like most of the people in this room, but actually, at the end of the day, when the lights go out and people are cold, they will not be thankful to the eco warriors. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I, I will support this motion, and I, I'm very happy to do so. I think we all know that um, uh, building works to um, historic buildings, to listed buildings, it, it's very important. Um, it's very sensitive as well. They're often iconic buildings in our villages, um, and there are often a lot of sensitivities um, around it. But, but I do support this motion, and I um, associate my marks with, uh, myself with the remarks which have been said about the thought that's clearly gone into it. I would just add one small point, though, which is I just hope that um, however this is implemented, it's implemented in a way that doesn't delay the planning process because these applications can, in any case, take some time. So I would just like to say I hope it's implemented in a way that doesn't delay unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just to add very quickly that, um, yes, we are aware of some of the difficulties that um, arise with trying to make historic buildings more energy efficient, and we have actually already started work on providing some help uh, to building owners. And if you went on the Greater Cambridge uh, planning website and looked at the uh, heritage section, you should be able to find some help there. It's not complete, it's work in progress. Um, and yes, um, I can assure Councillor Heather Williams that um, you know, we are already preparing help to assist um, uh, officers in making that judgment and yes, it's not been sort of explicitly put in there at the minute, but obviously uh, it's been considered. Um, it did take a bit of twin and froing to get this um, <laughs> this motion in the right or the right wording to make sure that we're not adding burden to officers and we're not trying to slow anything down. It's just to make sure that we are conscious of this again, sort of trying to get out the, the green uh, credentials. Um, one of the um, references that we put up on the uh, website, as I've said, is a guide to planning responsibly retrofit. The link is there, and I'd encourage you to refer your residents to it who might find it useful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Councillor Jeff Harvey, would you like to sum up? Yes, thank you, Chair, um, and, and thank you for all the contributions. Um, Firstly, um, Councillor Heather Williams, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with, with you that our officers um, are incredibly conscientious and um, also inc incredibly uh, under pressure at the moment. Um, and um, I think we, we did have a meeting with some senior officers and, and you know, most, of, most energy efficiency measures um, that, that we're talking about here um, do, do go through. Um, and, and I suppose whenever you've got a statutory sort of framework, it does uh, sort of struggle to um, address the particularities. And it does, it's inevitable that it throws out some anomalous results. Um, and I think that's why something that came out of our meeting, which sort of perhaps addresses um, Councillor Cathcart's concerns that we, we might um, throw out the baby with the bathwater here, is that a way forward would be to sort of, over time, develop a a sort of file of case histories, which, which kind of would not only show how to deal with those corner cases, but also improve on the um, consistency of outcomes, which I think is, is one of the, the sort of concerns here. Um, and I think we concluded, well, in, in uh, conversation with um, Council Dr. Toomey Hawkins, that really that wouldn't be helpful at the moment because the, of the pressure that the planning department is under. The last thing we want to do is give them an extra work. So, so I think that sort of idea of um, developing a sort of um, case file, if you, if you like, that people can refer back to to see how um, various cases have been dealt with in the past. Um, that could be a sort of medium term project, which I think, um, I hope that will kind of gradually evolve over, over the months and years. Um, but anyway, so I think um, that's what I'd like to say, but thank you for everyone. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. So I'm going to take the motion to the vote. Uh, so, everyone in support of the motion presented by Councillor Jeff Harvey, 
uh, press the blue button first to register your presence. Then press, if you're in favour, the green button. If you wish to object, the red button. And if you wish to abstain, the yellow button. Has everybody voted? Has everybody voted? Yes? Um, can I just check, has everybody voted? We've got 24 present, and Claire Thornton, your microphone is still on. For some peculiar reason. Is that the right number? Yeah. How many people are in the room? Can I just clarify, has anybody just chosen not to vote? Councillor Nick Wright left the room. Councillor Bridget Smith left the room. Okay, so um, thank you. So that, uh, what's your, your numbers or shall I? I can read it? Okay, so that means 24 in favour, no abstentions, uh, what, no, no against, one abstention. Uh, so that motion is carried. Thank you. The last uh, motion we have, 16D, is standing in the name of Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, I invite you to speak, Councillor Williams. Uh, Chairman, just so you know, the vote still appears on the board. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so, yes, yeah, so... This is to bring a, a report back to, to full council um, with the idea of us getting some picture because extensions of, um, of time have become a big topic of debate for other reasons, which I, I would really like us you know, to, to try and focus on the, the fact that we need this information in order to be able to know really how it's performing. Because to get the figures, including the extensions, could give us some false security or false sense of security. Um, and it would be reflective of the fact that our, our sort of performance statistics and the response and the things we get from residents seem to be slightly out of kilter. Um, I know that over, over many different vehicles, in many different ways, this information has been requested um, for some years now. and. We're, we're normally told that it's very difficult to work it out and everything else. Um, but we really do need these figures. And the reason I just give a short um, explanation as to why I've included the period as well is that we're told of, of the impacts of COVID. But we can't measure those impacts or really know if that is the impact, although I'm sure it's part of it, without um, an earlier comparison. So that's the reason for the for the length that's been given, because it seems unusual to have 24 months, but it's been an unusual time, and it'd be good to have some comparatives for this. Um, so very much hoping that this shouldn't be too controversial and that we can have this information, please, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a seconder, Councillor Williams? I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Graham Cohen. Councillor Aidan van der Beyer. Uh, yes, um, I would like to move um, a, a resolution to refer this motion uh, without further debate uh, to the Scrutiny and Overview Committee under um, uh, paragraph 13.6.C of the Standing Orders. Um, uh, I believe that I have a seconder. I'm happy to second. Is that Councillor? Goff, who's seconding that. So, Councillor Aidan van der Veer has proposed referral to the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Councillor Neil Goff has seconded. So, we go, in that case, we go straight to the vote. Can I take a vote on that? Deferral to the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. You've got the coats in front of you. Agreed? Is it agreed by affirmation? Does anybody wish to object to that? No. And any wish, but do we wish to abstain? So, it, in that case, it, by affirmation, we are we allowed to take a vote on this one? Yeah, yeah. 
So we take that by affirmation. It has been referred to scrutiny and overview committee. Thank you. Uh, the last item on the agenda uh, is uh, the chair's engagements. And uh, the next meeting of the council will be on the 25th of November at 2 p.m. Thank you. I close the meeting at 18.28. Thank you.